Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, I have before me four agendas for today's activities. Uh, for those who are having as much trouble as me keeping track, we're going. Just so you know, we're going to start with Strategic Initiative Standing Committee, followed by our in-camera meeting, followed by our Special Council agenda, followed by Corporate and Community Services Standing Committee. So, to call to order, Strategic Initiative Standing Committee. I will begin by reading the call to the uh, the uh, what do you call that? The, right, land acknowledgement. Thank you. For more than fifteen thousand years, the First Nations walked upon and cared for the lands we now call home. Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Ojibwe, and many others who were families, friends, and communities the way we are today. The town of Collingwood acknowledges the Lake Simcoe Nottawasaga Treaty of eighteen eighteen and the relationship it establishes with the original inhabitants of Turtle Island. We acknowledge the reality of our shared history and the current contributions of Indigenous people within our community. We seek to continuing empowering expressions of pride amongst all of diverse stakeholders in this area. We seek to do better and to continue to recognize, learn, and grow in friendship and community, nation to nation. Now, uh, the next item on the agenda, of course, is the adoption of the agenda. Uh, there's two items uh, here, and then I'll look to see if anyone would like to add other items. Uh, so 2.1, that the content of the Strategic Initiative Standing Committee agenda for December 5, 2022 be adopted as amended. The first one is T20-2018-2022, Q3 Financial Report and Forecast, Staff Report and Recommendation Added. The second is T2022-15, Fees and Service Charges, Staff Report and Recommendation Added. Uh, any changes or additions? Yes. Thank you, Mayor Hamlin. I would move, first of all, and then I would ask to, um, if you could indulge me by moving 10.1 up before 7.0 before Staff Reports. As I'm uh, traveling on council business, and I'll uh, be leaving at five to four. Okay, so that's ten point one. And could you just say again where you wanted it moved to? Uh, just before staff reports, please. Before seven point zero. Okay, and that is ten point one. Uh, could I ha have a seconder for that, Deputy uh, Mayor Fryer? Any comment on that? We'll have to bring that to a vote. All in favor? And that's that's carried. Thank you. Did you have another item? I don't think so. No. Okay. Uh, I also have one that would be to move uh, item 8.1, uh, which is the update on the affordable housing uh, task force initiatives, to uh, 4.2. So in other words, it would follow as uh, one of the deputation items here today. Uh, and also, I'll secondly provide just a brief update on the Sunset Manor uh, Issues. Do I need a motion? Okay. Uh, so I'd like to have a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Thank you. That would be uh, Councillor Ring and uh, Councillor Doherty seconds that. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? And that's passed. Thank you. Uh, declarations of pecuniary interest. Deputy Mayor Fryer. Thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, in regards to item 7.2, uh, T2022-15, two, 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 fees and service charges, um, there's a portion in there in regards to the extension or continuation of uh, taxi service fees. And I have to disclose uh, an interest. Uh, my sister and brother-in-law have ownership in in ACE cabs, um, so I will be declaring uh, non-participating um, uh, interest as per the con code of conduct. And I'll, I was hoping to, when we reach that item, I'll ask if that portion can be separated from the overall discussion and so I can participate on everything else, and then I'll step aside when the taxi services are dealt with. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other pecuniary interest today? No, and if you find yourself in that position, uh, please just let me know. 
So on to deputations. We have two then today. The first one is the Georgian Triangle Humane Society funding request. Please come forward. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. So we have a slideshow presentation that is going to be loaded. And Sonia, could you please introduce yourself? I will. Oh, you will. Okay, thank you. I time myself as well, so I won't ah. take too long. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Sonia Reichel. I'm the Executive Director with the Georgian Triangle Humane Society. Next slide, please. And it's my absolute pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about the programs and services that the Georgian Triangle Humane Society offers our community, some challenges that we are experiencing, some solutions we have to those challenges, and an opportunity for partnership as we move forward into the future. Next slide, please. But to start, I wanted to start with a thank you. Uh, we have had a great relationship with the Town of Collingwood for the 10 years that I have been Executive Director with this organization. On an annual basis, you provide us with $2,000 worth of funding in, in, through grants that allow us to provide spay neuter services to feral cats in this area. We are also your pound provider, and we've just uh, really benefited from a great relationship. So we want to say thank you very much. Uh, and as we move to the, forward, uh, to the future with our growing population, we um, look forward to expanding and evolving that partnership. Next slide. But a little bit about us. Uh, our organization, uh, as you well likely know, accepts in stray and surrendered cats and dogs. We have about 1,500 cats and dogs that come to us every single year. We operate a humane society uh, on 10th line. It is a 6,000 square foot building that was designed 25 years ago to accommodate 500 stray and homeless animals every single year. Today, we have 1,500 homeless animals that come to us, as well as 1,000 that we work with the community to keep in their homes, therefore preventing them from coming into the Humane Society and keeping them with their family unit during times of emergency. To that end, some of the numbers are illustrated here. We have about 1,300 adoptions that go through our facility on an annual basis. We operate a small but mighty companion animal hospital that provides 1,600 spay-neuter surgeries per year. And that's a really impressive fact because what that means is that we are preventing unwanted uh, litters of kittens and puppies from being born, helping to keep pop pet population under control. We employ 27 staff and 250 volunteers, 60% of which come and live within the town of Collingwood. Uh, we accept in 440 stray uh, cats and dogs per year, over 500 uh, surrendered cats and dogs, and an interesting stat is that 50% of the stray cats that come to us come to us from the town of Collingwood. Uh, we also provide pet support services. We believe that pets belong with their families, and oftentimes families in our communities are, expect, are experiencing one-time emergencies. So that is women that are fleeing domestic violence, and we know that 56% of women will delay leaving a situation of, that is dangerous if a pet is in the home. So we have partnered with my friend's house and offer emergency boarding services. Secondarily, we have our emergency medical assistance programs. Oftentimes, families or individuals in our community will experience a one-time emergency with their pet and aren't able to afford it. Our program allows them to not have to make the option for euthanasia or surrender into our humane society, but we work with the local veterinarian to keep them with their family. And often, that is their best friend. That is their companion. That is helping them to manage depression and anxiety and keeping them uh, and preventing loneliness in the household. So this, this program is working to keep pets with their families. And finally, we offer a pet food bank. We know that if a family is experiencing food insecurity, pets are impacted as well. And we also know that people will often prioritize food for their pets over nutrition for themselves. So our pet food bank that distributes 18,000 meals into the community every single year helps to improve wellness of the entire family unit. Next slide, please. This is a list of our programs and services. Oftentimes folks know about the adoption services that, they, that we run, but they are unaware of the services that we utilize around the human animal bond that works to improve wellness for people in our community. And I'll, I'll go over a few of them. We have, that's okay, uh, you, can, you can keep there. We have our spay neuter programs. We have Treasure Tales, which is located in downtown Collingwood. We have resources for pet owners. So after our Humane Society closes every single day, we open up resources to the community. We offer dog training programs, dog behavior consultations, dog behavior being one of the number one reasons that we have dogs surrendered into our facility. And finally, we run youth programs. We have 2,000 youth that come through our Humane Society every single year 
operating through our programs, and it's centered around an improvement to their mental health. We know that if youth work with animals, they learn about how animals think, feel, and communicate, and that translates to an increase in their social and emotional skill development, which improves their ability to think, communicate, uh, form connections and relationships with their peers, with their parents, and with their teachers. So we have 2,000 youth that go through those programs every single year in after-school programs and certified programs that you can see on our website. Next slide, please. And finally, our work with the town of Collingwood. We are your pound provider. So if a stray dog is picked up 24 hour, any, any time throughout the day, they can come to our Humane Society. They stay for a period of time while we look to find their owner. If we don't find their owner, then they go into our adoption program. Furthermore, we run free spay-neuter programs for feral cats. When I first started working here 10 year, years ago, we had many, many conversations about the feral cat problem that was happening in this municipality. If you walk down any of the trees, treed streets, you would see cats out on front lawns because of an inaccessibility to spay neuter surgery. Today, we are providing one day per week, uh, one day per month from our hospital where we provide free feral services for cats um, that are feral. And finally, we accept in stray and surrendered cats and dogs. We have about 200 pets that come to us from Collingwood on an annual basis. About 50% of our stray intake cats are also from Collingwood, which I had mentioned previously. And we know that this population is growing and we know that people are prioritizing choosing pets in their home. Uh, and that stat is growing. 32% of Canadians are choosing to have a pet in their home. And that stat increases when we talk about millennials. So as a population grows, there's going to be more pets that are going to be growing with it which leads me into our next slide. And this is our future. Uh, we identified a critical and urgent need for capital expansion. Uh, our property on 10th line is extraordinary, but as I said, it was designed 25 years ago and it did not anticipate the, the population growth that we are experiencing right now. To that end, we purchased five acres of land on Sanford Fleming Drive last year, um, and we are in the middle of designing a 19,000 square foot building that will be a regional center for pets and people, allowing us to continue to offer services to our community as it grows and expands. So that's three times our current uh, building size. We will have opportunities for volunteers. There'll be 600 volunteer opportunities, as well as uh, an ability to employ 50 full-time <laughs> staff member, attracting those folks to our community. Finally, we'll be attracting 30,000 visitors on an annual basis. They'll be coming to adopt from us. They'll be coming to be part of our programs and services and our events, um, enjoying the beautiful uh, community that we are all a part of. Next slide, please. This, um, this capital project that we are embarking on is a $14 million capital campaign. To that end, we are in conversations with eight municipal partners because we understand that this is going to be a collaborative effort in order for us to reach our goal. Conversations are happening right now uh, with each of these municipalities um, with an opportunity for partnership that if we, we know if we all work together, if we all get behind this, then we can make this a reality for our community into the future. And that brings us to where we are today. Currently, uh, we would like to acknowledge and thank the town of Collingwood for entering into negotiations with us over our existing building, which is right beside Publix Works. And anyone who has been down there can see where we have space constraints going on today, let alone into the future. Uh, those negotiations are underway and we are grateful for the opportunity. But today I am here to ask for thoughtful consideration around two items. The first is a consideration around waiving fees that are going to be associated with this build. Those being uh, building permit fees, development fees. As I said previously, we are entering into a site plan um, application and there will be fees associated with that. So we would ask for thoughtful consideration and that will allow us to keep this project uh, efficient. Um, uh, at and secondly, we are talking, as I mentioned previously, to all the surrounding municipalities, including the town of Collingwood. We are hoping to raise $2 million collectively amongst those municipalities to help us reach our fundraising goal. For the town of Collingwood, we ask for thoughtful consideration around $250,000 over four years um, that will work towards that $2 million goal um, and ultimately the $14 million goal that we are working towards. And that is it from me today. Uh, I thank you very much for an opportunity uh, to speak and present and welcome any questions that you might have. Well, thank you so much uh, for that presentation and for the good work you're doing in our community. Uh, would there be any questions uh, from Council? Yes, Councillor Doherty. <clears throat> thank you. Um, and uh, three.
uh, our presenter. Um, so the request for funding over four years, uh, is it your plan that, or is it um, your um, intention that the first installment would be out of the 2023 or 2024 budget? Um, but from our planning, we can see that a lot of the, the building associated fees are coming out in 2023. So our request would be that it comes out of the in kind, the waiving of fees come out of the 2023 budget and the donation come out starting in 2024. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Councillor Baines. Coming up on that, is there a, a approximate estimation of what the waiving of fees would come in at? Uh, by somewhere our last between 40 estimate, and 50. It was $264,000. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'll turn this to our CAO to respond. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, either to uh, the Director of Planning or our Treasurer, we did actually look at the fees um, when we saw the deputation. So we have a more recent calculation we could provide, uh, just a rough Great. one for today. Yes, uh, uh, Treasurer Quinlan, would you like to respond, please? Yes, thank you, Your Worship, through you um, to Councillor Baines. Uh, we have taken a look at what those uh, fees would be, and just with the updated development charges that are occurring, you'll see that report in the next um, couple of minutes. The approximate value would be about 315000 uh, based on today's rate. So that includes um, building fees, uh, planning uh, application fees, as well as development charges understanding that's only the town portion of um, development charges that are included. We don't include um, the County of Simcoe or the Board of Education charges there as well. So it's about 315000 Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you again. Take care. I wonder if it would be opportune to have a motion, uh, if anyone's interested, to refer this to our budget uh, discussions with an update from staff. Councillor Doherty. So moved. Could I have a seconder? Councillor Jeffrey, any comment? All those in favor? And that's passed. Thank you. All right. The second uh, deputation is, as I mentioned, we've moved from 8.1, and it's the affordable housing update. Um, and I'll turn this over to Clerk Amis. Certainly. Thank you. We do have uh, our housing uh, specialist uh, with us today. I'm not sure if our Director of Planning, Building, and Economic Development wanted to provide a brief intro or if we're jumping right in. Okay, jump right in. <laughs> Thank you. Um, through you, Your Worship, to members of Council, my name is Jen Ray, and I'm the Town of Collingwood's Housing Development Coordinator. I'm joined by Doug Linton, Chair of the Town's Affordable Housing Task Force. It is our pleasure to be here today and have this opportunity to update you on the affordable housing work that's been done so far, and to share some exciting updates that will unfold over the next few months. Before we dive in, we wanted to play a quick video for you highlighting some of the members of our affordable housing task force. Next slide, please. There should be a, a video on the previous slide. Oh, it doesn't appear to be working. That's okay. We will send over the uh, the link to the video um, to members of council following this meeting. Uh, we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, so you'll hear directly from Doug shortly, but before we look at the task force history, I wanted to acknowledge that we recognize that council has had some difficult conversations over the last week or so. You've heard directly from community members that are suffering from the housing crisis, and that's a tough position to be in. It's one thing to be aware of the issue, and it's another thing to hear from people who are in the throes of desperation. So I understand that saying we're working on it can fall flat when you're speaking to people who need help right now. It's often our nature to see what isn't being done and to focus on the problem. This is referred to as a needs model, where emphasis is placed on local deficiencies. Problems can become overwhelming in a needs-based approach, 
resulting in a fragmented response, a, de a dependency on systems, and little opportunity for citizens to contribute to the solution. I urge you instead to take an assets-based approach when it comes to affordable housing. Assets-based community development identifies and builds upon community strengths, empowering individuals, associations, and institutions to come together and mobilize resources around this issue. We have an abundance of assets here in Collingwood. We have the drive, we have local experts, we have an invested community, and we have resources dedicated to this issue. Let's build on these assets and continue moving forward together. Next slide, please. This is Doug Linton's slide. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Jen, my apologies. <laughs> Thank you uh, and good afternoon, folks. Uh, first of all, I just want to apologize uh, for my croaky voice and sometimes need to cough. I'm struggling through with one of the various bugs going around our community lately. So to build just on what Jen has just been talking about, we've been doing a lot of research and a lot of analysis. And we seem to be now being moving to be moving more into the action phase of the work that we've been tasked to do. It also seems to coincide with exactly what the public is is asking for. You know, when you're when you're passionate about an issue, and I think you'll find that every member of the task force is extremely passionate about the issue. You want to solve it. You want to get moving on things. But it's it's not just the task force that feels that way. I think you've you've heard from people. Again, I, I understand particularly this week from the coffee and council sessions that housing affordability is is the issue for council to be working on. Sometimes it takes an outsider's perspective to show you, though, how far along you, you already are when you're working in it as closely as we have been for as long as we have been. We sometimes fail to see the accomplishments and the the unique position that we are in. And we are in a unique position in particular. We have been told time and time again by academics, consultants, and experts in the world of affordable housing projects, just how much ahead of the curve Collingwood is in, primarily because we have a municipally owned property ready for redevelopment with an affordable housing project, specifically the Birch Street properties. You know, of course, there are complications. There's no question. There's going to be challenges uh, from zoning, my understanding. Now, maybe that'll be uh, solved through the, the new zoning bylaws to, to where do we rehouse the current tenants during a redevelopment process to negativity and nimbyism coming from neighbors. But we are in a unique position to be able to move forward and relatively quickly this, this is commented on time and time again by those people who we've been working with in the community who are experts in this field. It's not just the Birch Street properties, though. Collingwood seems to be ahead of the game due to its force, the foresight of council to create a task force and to support the work that we've been doing as much as you have. These comments, they, they continue to take us by surprise, I suppose. Again, when you're in it, you don't really see it. But we often feel that we've barely scratched the surface. Um, but when we take a look at the assets that we've already got in place, you know, we have a task force that is so dedicated and committed. We have a dedicated staff person, our housing development coordinator, Jen Ray, who's proven herself so early on in, in her tenure to be really remarkably good at what she does. We have a reserve fund, we have the support of council and from the past council who had the foresight to establish the resources and, and from the newly elected council who are already making the time for the important conversations for going through orientation sessions and learning what it is exactly we're facing. So quickly, how did we get to where we are today? This is just a very brief summary from the presentation that I made to the United Nations Summit a few weeks back. In January 2021, Town Council, in response to the World Summit 2020 resolution, unanimously moved to establish an affordable housing task force. Citizens of Collingwood applied for and were appointed to be members of the task force, and the group included a diverse mixture of industry experts, councillors, 
individuals from various walks of life who were either directly impacted by the lack of affordable housing or had experience in related fields. Uh, if we could move on to the next slide with our mandate, please. So the mandate that we were given was to, first of all, investigate opportunities and make a recommendation to council regarding those town owned lands on Birch Street, the Johnson Trust properties, to make recommendations for local planning policies and processes supporting affordable housing initiatives. Uh, to make recommendations regarding current grants and funding opportunities for affordable housing initiatives. And finally, to provide support for an action plan for Council regarding Collingwood's commitment to the UN Sustainability Goal number 11. Getting to the point of having a rudimentary understanding of the issue, the social, the financial costs, the human stories of hardship and struggle, the impact on businesses and, and healthcare costs, all of these uh, understanding requires a very deep dive. And very fortunately, we, we had individuals appointed to the task force who are committed to taking that deep dive. Three subgroups were formed to address the first three items on of our agenda or our mandate and members met subgroups either weekly, mostly weekly uh, or in biweekly. And then we also met biweekly as, a, as an entire task force. Uh, in addition to the volunteers appointed to the task force, we also had means councillors Jeffrey and Hamlin, and then Deputy Mayor Keith Hull as part of our group. Their insight and support was invaluable in the process, and we thank them uh, com completely. Uh, the municipality also dedicated significant resources to the task force by assigning incredibly supportive and knowledgeable staff to assist our efforts. Many thanks to Clerk Sarah Almas. Secretary Stephanie Honderson and Planner Nathan Wakush. Finally, we have to acknowledge the work of Nick Michael from N. Barry Lyons Consulting, who worked hand in hand with us, analyzing data, making st statistics actually mean something. And in the case of the policy and process subgroup, providing vital input into the recommendations that we made. As we began to understand the issue in greater detail, we realized the kind of long-term time frames to put certain potential effective solutions into play. As a result, on July 5th of last year, we presented an update and a recommendation to council asking them to instruct staff to immediately begin work of researching and writing a report regarding whether a municipality-wide community improvement plan supporting affordable housing initiatives and projects would be an appropriate and effective tool for Collingwood. This recommendation was approved by last council on July 19th. A little over a year ago, November 1st of last year, we presented our report, which included comprehensive and detailed recommendations prioritized into key points that council adopted with only some minor changes. So significantly, the town of Collingwood included in their 2022 budget, and these are very significant. First of all, the establishment of an affordable housing reserve fund of $350,000. The hiring of an affordable housing planning specialist, our uh, housing development coordinator, Jen, and the establishment of an affordable housing advisory committee to advise council on steps to implement recommendations found within that report. Briefly, I'd like to talk about the first point around the establishment of an affordable housing reserve fund. Uh, you may be aware that I submitted a brief to Mayor Hamlin in which I indicated that the task force stands by its original recommendation that 1% of tax revenues or $350,000 be annually, annually contribute to the affordable housing reserve fund as, uh, as opposed to what has been recommended within the 2023 budget. As a reserve fund, I think we're asking, shouldn't it be built up uh, over time, those funds to be held in reserve when opportunities present themselves so that the municipality can take advantage of the opportunities and to be able to allow them to be bold and moving forward with initiatives. You know, understandably, $350,000 is a lot of money. On the other hand, $350,000 is not a lot of money. For example, if staff does recommend that a community improvement plan to help offset, let's say, for example, development costs associated with affordable housing projects, it needs to be funded, and that funding needs to be substantial. I'm, I'm 
taken by the fact that we were just uh, learned that the waiving of those development fees for a potential GTHS building is in the sum of around $315,000. Um, it's a big chunk of change. And if we're looking to do a community improvement plan that looks at the, at supporting uh, affordable housing initiatives with the waiving of those fees as well, then you can imagine the kind of cost that we're gonna get into. If a piece of property perfectly located and zoned for an affordable housing project comes available, wouldn't it be ideal to have the funds in reserve to actually purchase that property? These are a couple of uh, uh, examples of reasons why we at the task force are committed as we are to our original recommendation regarding the 1% annually uh, to top up that reserve fund. Going back to uh, the, the budget notes from last year, uh, particularly around the establishment of the advisory committee, in February of this year, council did extend the mandate and approve the terms of reference for the affordable housing task force to assist in the creation of the affordable housing master plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also at that time, uh, council authorized the expenditure out of the reserve fund to retain a consultant to assist in the creation of that master plan. And we're now eagerly uh, awaiting uh, word as to who it is that will be helping us out with that. Clearly there's been significant movement on many items that we made within our, our report and the recommendations. The support of previous council was unanimous and considering that housing affordability was recognized as the primary election issue, we expect continued focus on and support of the housing file. Finally, uh, uh, just a final note, I think we on the task force, we're, we're, we're getting a better handle on the role and the responsibilities and how we can help to move the needle forward with the housing file. For clarity purposes, the Affordable Housing Task Force sees itself as a tool, as a resource for council and staff. We are committed to doing the research and the groundwork to assist staff as they make their reports to council and to council as they make their decisions around affordable housing initiatives. We're very excited to be a part of the team to help develop the housing master plan and to see that, and, and we see that as our primary focus in the short term. Housing affordability is a big, complicated, nuanced, and incredibly impactful issue facing the municipality. However, you're in a very good position due to the previous council's foresight and the current council's support to do something truly exciting and meaningful for our community. Thanks for your time and I'll hand it back to Jen at this point. Thanks, Doug. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to touch on um, one of the items that Doug had mentioned, which was the task force's terms of reference, which was adjusted in February, 2022 from the original mandate with the four, the four items that Doug touched on earlier. Um, so the, the updated mandate is now on your screen and for the benefit of new members of council, um, the Affordable Housing Task Force will continue to provide advice, guide, and assistance in the coordinating, fulfillment, and implementation of approved affordable housing recommendations and consult on the preparation of an affordable housing master plan, as Doug just mentioned. The task force will also act as a forum for community conversation, communication, relationship building, advocacy, and championing to advance affordable housing objectives, including leading or contributing to grassroots initiatives and address affordable housing matters that are from time to time referred to the task force by council. Members of the task force may be requested to champion specific functions as deemed appropriate. On a personal note, I'm so grateful for the for council for extending the task force's advisory role. And I wanna take this opportunity to thank the task force for sharing their knowledge, insights and time so generously with me over the past few months. Next slide, please. As an advisory body, the task force provides recommendations to SIC and Council and guidance to town staff and the CAO. Staff develop reports developed through task force recommendations, consultants, and other partners, and additional research. Management reviews staff's work and often has the difficult task of striking a balance with other goals and priorities across the organization. Finally, Council receives reports with staff's best guidance, and ultimately it is you who make the decisions on how we move forward. Next slide, please. 
The second point I wanted to add on to were the items that have been directed by Council to date. As Doug already pointed out, the Affordable Housing Reserve Fund was created and the Housing Development Coordinator role was developed. In February, Council also approved that staff proceed with a request for proposals for an affordable housing master plan. And in September, Council approved that a rapid accessory dwelling unit program be created. Also earlier this fall, the third Collingwood World Summit Habitat in Towns convened leaders in affordable housing from the region and internationally to share best practices and innovations in affordable housing. In addition to these public facing projects, it's important to know that affordable housing is a key component of much of our current day to day work. There are a variety of developments in different stages and staff are taking every opportunity to carry the affordable housing torch into the conversations that they are having with the developers on those projects. Through the review and improvement of the service capacity allocation policy, we're having conversations with the development community about securing affordable housing that we never would have had before. Our official plan is under review and our team is pushing for policy revisions that will allow for more affordable housing opportunities. We are reviewing and responding to provincial legislative changes like bills 109 and 23 that have major impacts on housing. We are working with the developer of the Poplar Regional Health and Wellness Village to ensure that affordable housing units are created within this project. We participate with the, community, with the County of Simcoe on their Attainable Housing Strategic Plan project and coordinate with neighbor, neighboring municipalities, interagency, cross-boundary groups, and municipal liaison groups. We are reaching out to municipalities across North America that are working to address the same crisis in their own communities. And we're developing partnerships and connecting dots across the region as we work as we continue to work closely with the Affordable Housing Task Force. Next slide, please. In just a few short weeks, Council and our community will begin to feel the momentum surge as the Affordable Housing Master Plan kicks off. We expect to award the Affordable Housing Master Plan by year's end so that we can hit the ground running in January. We know that there is some pushback around more studies and more talk when the community wants to see action. But we view the Affordable Housing Master Plan as a critical tool to help guide Council's decision making, ensuring that we're using taxpayer dollars for the maximum community benefit and on the ground results. The Master Plan will answer big questions, including whether or not the town should own and operate housing, if housing should become a town program, and if the town should monitor and, and enforce long-term affordability when incentives are provided, to name just a few of the items that the Master Plan will, will approach. Not only will the master plan provide strategic direction for the town's role in affordable housing, it will also provide an action plan and budget and resourcing considerations for short, medium, and long-term efforts, and also a plan for how to implement those actions and the tools required to take action. Community consultation will be an early component of the master plan process. We expect that public and stakeholder meeting sessions will be driven by the consultant and hope that the Affordable Housing Task Force will continue their role of being a forum for community conversation by co-hosting these sessions. By taking a coordinated approach to engagement efforts, we can ensure that not only the best use of everyone's time, but that community input is recorded and channeled into the master plan recommendations. We are grateful to the Affordable Housing Task Force for their continued efforts in providing advice, guidance, and assistance throughout the master plan consultation. Next slide, please, and I'll turn it over to Doug. So yeah, so so um, as I was mentioning at the end of my uh, final note prior, uh, we hope that we can provide those kinds of supports and that kind of research and that kind of guidance to council and to staff to be able to assist in whatever process that you see moving forward. The, the bit that Jen made reference to around community consultations and about uh, about engaging the community is vital. I mean, one of the roles that we really see ourselves uh, playing on, on behalf of the municipality is that of an education role. We're hopeful. You know, that's one way that we, we hope that we can combat some of the negative ideas and some of the misinformation that exists out there around what affordable housing is, as opposed to what social housing is and what's, what uh, subsidized housing is. We're hoping that we can provide that link between uh, council and staff and the community in terms of providing that information and making sure that folks are well-informed and advised 
and can feel part of the solution because again, everyone in the town is recognizing that this is the number one issue that's having a major impact on every aspect of our lives here in Collingwood. So again, we're here to support council. We're here to support staff in whatever capacity you see fit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in closing, there are a lot of moving parts and we are really looking to the master plan to help direct our actions. Our community is asking, what are you doing to provide more affordable housing? And I can assure you that there's a lot of work happening in the background and much more public facing efforts to come. Uh, but we need help. Everyone in our community has a role to play and the citizens of Collingwood can take action by participating in upcoming master plan consultations, being champions and saying yes in my backyard, understanding how housing instability impacts our community socially and economically. And if they don't know where how to start to educate themselves, I encourage community members to reach out to me or any member of the task force. Um, community members can also talk about affordable housing with their friends, neighbors, and colleagues. Understand who's impacted, you might be surprised. And consider adding an accessory dwelling unit on your property so that more people will have a place to call home in our community. A rapid accessory dwelling unit program We'll be rolling out in the new year, but you don't have to wait to hear the details. Reach out now and we'll take a look at what is possible on your property. We're going to have to work together to move forward. So let's look at those assets. Let's build on our collective strengths and band together to support our neighbors. Your worship, members of council, we thank you for your time today. Recognizing that that was a lot of information to take in, I promise to follow up by email with reports and background information for your reference. Thank you. Ray, you have uh, picked up the mantle and very admirably, uh, you know, running with it. So thank you for your dedication uh, to this role. And again, thank you to our chair of the Affordable Housing Task Force, uh, Doug Linton, uh, having, of course, been one of the members of the last council that participated on the task force and subcommittees. I know how lucky we are in Collingwood to have the caliber uh, of people who volunteered to sit on that task force and the commitment and, and dedication uh, to make to driving this forward. And so thank you, all of you. I know you are all still meeting and working hard on this matter. Um, would any members of council like to ask questions of, of these presenters? Uh, perhaps, uh, will we have uh, your ask, of course, uh, Chair Linton, uh, before our budget committee. So I don't think we need any further direction on that. So I'll just say thank you so much uh, again for your comments today. Thank you. So the, the uh, next item on the agenda is the update from CEO Skinner on the interim control bylaw. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, there should be a short deck that I'll just go through uh, quickly. Um, this is uh, one item. Uh, we actually have two items that now have uh, reoccurring updates for council. Uh, one of them uh, being this uh, interim control bylaw and what we're doing about our drinking water situation. Um, so I think the deck will come up shortly. The other one was a, a, a request for monthly updates on the uh, ministerial zoning order in the Poplar Health and Wellness Village. So we are just uh, diving into starting on those, but that's not the update today. So um, if you could go to the uh, next slide, please. The resolution that uh, came from our uh, council is uh, just about to come onto your screen. And it is an update once a month. And it asks that council and the public get the latest on any water supply agreement negotiations, uh, the water treatment plant and its funding exemptions from the interim control bylaw so that we can continue with building a complete community here in Collingwood, uh, building permits and occupancy permits, and the remaining water supply. Uh, so that's what we've included. Next slide, please. 
though the situation is uh, unlike uh, people have assumed, we do have a current water supply. It is safe. It is available. Uh, Council has made some decisions on um, how to allocate that water supply over the next number of years. Uh, Council's been very proactive and transparent in how it's approached this challenge. And we've used, uh, under Council's uh, agreement, uh, vote, an interim control bylaw to temporarily and transparently pause the allocation of water. Uh, so far, most ready-to-go development applications have been approved once Council looked at them through uh, a lens of a complete community and with an understanding of the servicing required. And uh, most residential renovations and business changes continue. We're now uh, allocating water uh, through council decisions and a merit-based servicing capacity allocation policy. We call it the SCAP, S-C-A-P, the Servicing Capacity Allocation Policy, up to an annual cap that council can uh, revisit annually. Uh, we are closing in the, on the capacity to meet our expected growth if we can get our new com, uh, plant uh, commissioned on schedule in late 25 or early 2026. And uh, so far, the schedule news has been good. And I will uh, go over that in the slide that's just about to come up. Next slide, please. Uh, so the, from a policy perspective, next slide. Uh, once the study was complete, there were three legs on the stool to make sure that Co Collingwood was well positioned for the future. Uh, the SCAP or the allocation policy is complete and was adopted by council last May. That's the bottom right leg of the stool. Uh, the draft of the official plan has been out for public consultation and we'll be coming back to council to, uh, to see the next draft soon. So that's in flight. And in uh, and the top, we also need a zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, there were three appeals and uh, two are outstanding, which I believe is the next slide, please. Uh, so there are two remaining appeals uh, that staff and the legal team have been working on uh, without uh, prejudice discussions uh, with these uh, folks and also uh, seeking an OLT a date uh, mid next year uh, for the uh, Ontario Land Tribunal to deal with these if necessary. And one appeal has been resolved. Next slide. Um, we do have an ability for people to get servicing to move forward and they're called exemptions to the interim control bylaw. Uh, we're now using the new policy for the allocation of water. So planning applications for major developments are coming to council for decision uh, through the uh, normal development process. And we've had a number of those come to the last council and will be coming to this council. Um, uh, we did have a number of uh, exemption intakes for minor development and those have been completed for 2022. And we have a report uh, targeting the Development and Operations Committee next week. So Council will see our proposal for how you can manage these decisions moving into 23. And I just want to remind the public is if you've received an exemption, please continue through the processes so that you can uh, use that allocation of servicing uh, that was put toward your development. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a summary of the projects that Council has exempted. Um, uh, this deck will be available offline on our uh, uh, iCompass portal uh, if you don't get a chance to see all the numbers very quickly. But basically 29% on the top right uh, far side of that table, 29% uh, of the uh, single development units worth of water have not yet applied for a building permit. Um, but that does mean that just over 70% have in, in our various states of being either under reviewed, issued, occupied, or there are 33 units on hold for affordable housing should council trigger that to move forward. So we have some water put aside for that. Uh, the number of building permits issued is on the bottom right. In 2020, it was at 701. In 2021, we ended up at 781. And so far to date in 2022, we're a bit uh, lower than that. We're closing in toward 500. So I don't know if that's the end of COVID or uh, maybe a little slowing in the market. We've had a bit less building from the number of permits so far, knowing the year's not yet over. Next slide, please. From a plant water capacity perspective, next slide. The, uh, we, of course, have an agreement with New Tecumseh. Uh, the water treatment plant expansion is on track. Uh, the uh, 
ultraviolet UV installation has had some delays. Uh, we ha will have everything ready to accept the equipment when it arrives, uh, which is anticipated for January. Uh, we have our general contractors, three of them on board, to provide us with some uh, constructability reviews. And I'm going to talk about the schedule in the next slide a little bit more. But we do have a new uh, 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 tracking system for um, a ledger, we're calling it, for wastewater and drinking water now set up so that all the decisions that are going through planning or building or site plan approvals are accounted for and that we can see when projects move from being a, an approval to using the capacity at the plant itself. Next slide. So this is a slide we've been using in every single presentation. Um, a, I'm really, really happy to see that dark blue moving up from the bottom as things get done. I think the team's done a fantastic job keeping us on track. We've had interim changes in dates, but we have had no changes to final dates. We did think that late fall we would get to the 90% design. It is looking more like it will be winter 23, but we're still on track for the overall deliverable. Delivery. So this is uh, not too many projects of this size that I've been involved with that have stayed uh, um, so true to dates as this one. Next slide. Uh, that's it for this uh, month's update. And pending any questions, um, we're we're glad to keep you in the loop. Oh, thank you very much for that comprehensive update. Any member of council have any questions? Yes, Deputy Mayor Fryer. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin, and through you to the CEO. Um, thank you for the update. Uh, we're, I guess, almost a month into our um, required participation as new council members, and and it's good to get a detailed uh, um, uh, information session on it. I wondered, uh, in regards to uh, water, um, if we could get an idea of uh, when I am expecting that we'd have a planned day of, of education and orientation about water. Um, do you have any idea on, an, on a rough horizon for that? Um, th through your worship, uh, we don't have a date for that yet, but it is one of the higher priority trainings because as you mentioned and know, there are some obligations for council members very specifically around the provision of drinking water and we want to make sure you're trained. We will get back to council on that date. Thank you, Mayor Hamlin. And just one follow-up, uh, that is one of the major things. And and just being familiar with the uh, new Tecumseh contract, I think so important uh, because of the size of the project for one, but also the allocation uh, constraints we have. So I'm looking forward to that uh, session. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Doherty. Thank you, Chair. Um, and um, through you to, um, well, actually, this question may be for uh, either the uh, CAO or our Director of Planning. Um, what impact would Bill 23 have on our SCAP? Or is that the million dollar question? Well, it looks like we're going to have this answer uh, attempted, an attempted answer <laughs> by our director of planning. Go ahead. Indeed, Madam Chair, and to Councillor Doherty, an, an attempted answer. It's been a seismic shift in legislation and regulation recently at the province, so we're still working through with our legal counsel all of the changes that uh, that are forthcoming. Um, in terms of directly to the SCAP, uh, we haven't identified anything in particular at this moment. Uh, the province has certainly provided additional tools and incentives that may assist with the development community being um, more interested in pr the provision of affordable and attainable housing, which is something that we have uh, concentrated on quite um, in depth uh, on, through the SCAP process. So it might actually help uh, in some cases uh, provide additional incentives beyond the uh, servicing capacity to move the needle forward, uh, at least in that regard. Uh, we do have a presentation prepared uh, or in the... In the uh, being prepared for Development Operations Committee on the 12th in terms of the impact uh, of Bill 23 on the corporation as a whole. And we can certainly bring that question back as well uh, as part of that presentation. Thank you. Yes, okay. Councillor Baines. Uh, through you, uh, <clears throat> your worship to CAO Skinner, did I miss here or did you say we are approaching maximum allocation capacity? And if so, when does that trigger? I mean, do we have 10% left or 
whatever, and what are the implications of achieving maximum capacity allocation? Uh, through uh, through your worship to Councillor Baines, um, that is something that we've been looking at from a staff perspective very closely, and I know the, the past council was tracking very closely as well. Uh, most recently, and I think we can find a, a link for you from the last update, um, we have... Uh, under 1,500 uh, single development units worth of, of water uh, left. Um, in addition, there's also a, uh, a factor of safety uh, that uh, if we were very close to a new plant being um, in production, council could consider if they wanted to dip into that factor of safety. And uh, with all the numbers in front of them, the past council looked at how many years it may be, uh, the typical amount of building that happens in a year, and set a cap for 2022 and 2023. Um, uh, that was about, I think about uh, 450, I'm not exactly, I need to check that, but about 450 single development units worth of, worth of capacity. Uh, if we do build in 20, uh, sorry, if it's the plant is commissioned early in 2026, those numbers should be sufficient to meet our community's needs. If there were uh, s uh, substantial uh, delays, uh, then it would become more challenging and, and council would be faced with some difficult decisions uh, moving forward. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Councillor Jeffrey. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Baines, uh, thank you through the CO. Did I uh, answer, have my question answered? I was going to say as January 1st rolls around, we have another round of availability in terms of FCUs, and you've said approximately 450. And that's after we've set aside... Um, and put on hold some also for affordable, any affordable housing project that came along. We do have separate uh, SDUs available for that as well. Correct? Yeah. I have one question. Uh, there's construction uh, going on uh, at the water plant right now. Uh, perhaps you could uh, just let us know what that's about and if that's going to affect the uh, water capacity. Thank you. Yes, uh, Your Worship, the uh, construction, um, the major portion of the construction that is happening now is related to the installation of the ultraviolet treatment in the existing plant. Um, so I'm not positive there may be some other preparations uh, nascently starting for the bigger project, but the major project there is is to make sure that we can treat um, water that is quite cold during the winter appropriately. And that just allows us to maintain the numbers, I guess, that you've just uh, given to us? Uh, yes, Your Worship. That allows us to, uh, to maintain summer and winter once installed the current capacity of the plant, which is just over 31,000 megaliters a day. Thank you. Now, the next item on the agenda, uh, as we... Uh, determined early on was to move up the appointments. Uh, I'm just wondering if there might be an appetite to move forward the uh, notice of motion on here first from Deputy Mayor Fryer because the outcome of that motion uh, will could eliminate the first half of the appointment uh, discussion. Yes, Councillor Doherty. Oh, I'm sorry, Chair. I'm just wondering, will we be hearing from Mr. Ireland? I believe he's going to be speaking during the budget portion oh, of okay. our agenda. Okay. okay. Uh, had you thought about that? Or do you care? <laughs> <laughs> you have till five to four? Yeah, you have till five to four. four. Um, the alternative, I'll just say, is only dealing, just moving... Uh, forward, or just dealing with right now the latter part of 10.1 your committees, right. but otherwise we should deal with uh, Deputy Mayor Fryer's motion because we might not need to have standing committees, depending on how, how his or motion goes. Did I read it correctly for three months, you mean? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Do whatever, as long as I can vote on the other before I leave at 5 to 4, all right, I'm then. good. So I think if that's uh, all right uh, with everyone, if anyone objects, uh, speak up now. We'll move forward the notice of motion, which is 9.1. Thank you, Mayor Hamlin. And I'll read out the motion. Um, 
uh, that I'm putting uh, forward? So first, I, I think, think we should deal with the uh, notice requirements to for that. So perhaps I'll just say, uh, well, would you like to speak to why you'd like to waive the notice requirements? Just, I think, for the uh, precise reason you started to talk about in regards to um, our decisions about committees, uh, I was hoping that uh, we could waive motion today so we could entertain my notice of motion uh, because it would have an impact on that. Okay, thank you. Because otherwise, what happens for the new members, just to remind you, a notice of motion is typically read, I'll say, one meeting, and then it's just read, and then it's discussed and voted upon at a future council meeting. So the impact of this would be to discuss and vote to implement today. Okay, so we need a two-thirds majority of council to agree to uh, waive the, what's called the notice requirements. Is there any discussion on that? All those in favor? Oh, I sorry, need a seconder for that. Councillor Doherty, thank you. Uh, discussion, Councillor Jeffrey? Uh, I had one and it just went in and out. Um, I guess my only question would be, I do see there's provision here for a staff report to come here at the end of three months. I would have preferred the staff report ahead of having their input on actually doing this for three months. So I'm just wondering if we will if we do waive notice and we proceed with the discussion, if we'll be hearing from staff as to um, their input on making this change at this time without um, their review prior. As I read this, we would move right into uh, the committee of the whole. So in other words, development and operations and corporate and community services. Uh, we would immediately uh, structure those committees with all the members sitting on them and that would happen for three months. So we wouldn't have a staff report until March. Okay, so I will, I'm going to vote to waive notice for now, but I'm gonna have a, a lot of questions after. Okay, fair enough. All those in favor of waiving notice? And uh, I think we have our two thirds there, Clerk Almas. Okay, so uh, Deputy Mayor Farr, you wanna read in your motion? So I have this motion um, and uh, seconder is uh, Councillor Doherty. Uh, that council here in support waiving the notice requirement. I'm oh, sorry, um, I can go right down to the <laughs> to the motion. Um, whereas the procedural bylaw establishes the meeting framework for council and standing committees, and whereas a new governance structure such as committee of the whole could be advantageous, particularly with the number of new council members and potentially create more efficiencies. And whereas it may be prudent for the new council as a whole to work within the previous standing committee and council framework to understand the work and obligations of each standing committee. Now, therefore, be it resolved that council herein request waiving the procedural bylaw rules specific to the respective provisions within the bylaw to permit for a maximum of three months that all members of council be required to sit and have voting privileges on the development and operations services and the Corporate and Community Services Standing Committee, with the Mayor acting as Chair unless she otherwise delegates, and that quorum remain the same as Council. And further, that Council request the staff prepare a report on options for Council's consideration for Committee of the Whole governance model or potential other models for Council's consideration not later than March 2023. And I would uh, request to speak last. Last, okay, to. thank you. Uh, would anyone like to speak to this motion? Councillor Jeffrey, are you speaking to this? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I guess I, I was interested in what staff had to say in moving into this for, for um, three months, and I guess I'll be more interested in what happens at the end of three months. But it was staff's recommendation when I... Um, came back onto council in 2000, between 2014 and 2016, and staff recommended the um, what I deem to be um, uh, probably the best uh, format available to the public for their input and for um, focused work by council members. So the top three that staff advised us on when we brought this um, the current DevOp, the standing committee process that we have, was training for other council members to be able to chair meetings, uh, 
and give professional development and moving forward. Um, it allowed for much more public input and engaging the public in our process uh, much more readily and with um, a reduced time and more focused uh, council members with respect to different portfolios, uh, either CorpCom or DevOp, uh, the um, uh, departments that were covered under each of those have varied from um, time to time, but it allowed for focused work by five members of council, keeping the consistency of the mayor in all of them, uh, uh, to be able to, to work on them as opposed to um, uh, all of us at once, which, which can create sometimes a, a really long conversation that we can cut by five. And then... Um, I think the the other thing out of um, oh, there was another one there, but anyway, for me, that's the bulk of it. That I would have uh, some concern that we would be um, truncating uh, public input, uh, ability of professional development of other men members of council to be chair and vice chair, and um, and get more focused on our work in terms of uh, of the committees. So that's my input on it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Baines? Uh, through you, Your, your Worship, uh, to respond to that as one of the newly elected as the five, I realize that this would be, will be an implication or have implications both for the, uh, the public perhaps in those three months and for staff. However, I just think with five of us not knowing the ropes as well as we need to, that it is... Um, a worthwhile exercise to do, at least from my own point of view, to learn those ropes just temporarily for three months. Um, and I think that the cost, quote unquote, of doing that is worth it as far as education goes, at least from my own point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Doherty? Uh, thank you. Um, obviously, I'm very supportive of this uh, motion um, and um, thus I did second it um, for the reasons that um, have been mentioned already by uh, Councillor Bain that we do have a you know, mixed of, of experienced and uh, not so experienced uh, councillors. Um, but the other, but other than that, um, uh, Councillor Jeffrey just uh, spoke to the notion that this would eliminate some of that um, sort of uh, more unstructured, sleeve rolled up sort of um, stance that we have uh, permitted ourselves to take with the our current committee structure. But in my mind, there's no reason why those t committees cannot function in exactly the same way as they have. Um, that is to say, more public input, uh, more... Um, uh, a little bit more casual repartee between uh, council staff and members of the public, um, but still include all members of council. So um, am I mistaken on that? Uh, I'm not sure. That's um, right. Yeah. So, um, and then the other thing, um, when we uh, did review the uh, procedural bylaw the last time, uh, it seems to be that, that um, staff... Um, uh, we're uh, suggesting that a uh, committee of the whole structure would be uh, advantageous from, from their viewpoint. So if I'm not recalling that uh, accurately, perhaps uh, the clerk can, can correct me. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Clerk Almas. <clears throat> Well, thank you. Uh, through uh, your worship to Councillor Doherty, that is correct. We did bring a, a staff report back last fall um, and with some options, and staff were uh, looking at the Committee of the Whole as a potential uh, improvement. Right. Yeah. So for all those reasons, as long as we can retain that um, uh, slightly more, I'm going to say, open um, format um, in our discussions and uh, with members of the public, then I am totally in support of this recommendation. Thank you. Any other members like to comment? Yes, Councillor Ring. Just echoing, uh, is that on? 
just echoing exactly what they said, and, and I, I don't have to repeat it, but I, I think for my own personal opinion, um, being... Uh, and I can also see the... Uh, might be uh, and uh, a good idea for the council as a, as a whole... Um, Welcome to, uh, but when they question that you, you could probably save time uh, if you're all together at one at one. Okay, thank you for that comment. So, Deputy Mayor, would you like to have a final word? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin, and thank you to everyone for your comments. Uh, in discussing uh, my leanings towards what I w would like to see us do, um, in, in the fact that we were in this initial stage of things, um, through the staff, uh, the idea of a kind of a, a three months ish, uh, a little bit more um, uh, orientation period for everyone. Um, I was really trying to look at this as kind of like that temporary short term thing that'll give us um, all some extra information um, and some knowledge about it. And we'd have the, uh, the greater debate about uh, what procedure we'd like to use going forward after that. And um, I thought it was a good opportunity as well um, that every council member is in attendance, um, not just from interacting with any public that attend over the months through till March, but also staff. I think getting familiar with the, uh, the, the names and faces of the, of the staff who will be reporting to the various committees and such, uh, I thought that was something that uh, every uh, member would. Uh, so as I said, this was to try to get over the fact that we had to appoint our committees and recognize that uh, if we're going to uh, look at this, we need to look at it fairly soon. Um, I was I was hoping that the uh, the March uh, 2023 uh, time frame would work out. So good. Well, thank you uh, for bringing this motion forward. I think it's a terrific idea. Um, and so we'll just move to a vote now. All those in favor? Oh, sorry. Yes. Right. Thank you, Worship. Just for clarification, I know there was a question that came up previously that it did indicate in the resolution about. Uh, that the mayor continue to act as chair for the standing committees and, uh, unless she otherwise delegates. And I'm just wondering if we can get clarification um, maybe from the, the mover of the motion on whether you're wanting to follow basically section 2.5, the procedural bylaw, or whether it's completely the mayor's ability to delegate. Yes, go ahead, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mayor Hamlin, through you to the clerk. Um, I had been thinking of section 2.5, but I believe that's only applicable to council meetings, isn't it? Um, so technically, uh, the committee. So yes, I, I just was was looking at it uh, covering um, any delegation would be. I guess it would be to myself first, and then to uh, to Councillor Jeffrey as uh, lead counselor. Yes. Yes. Okay. Is that all right for everybody? Okay. Great. Uh, have we voted? No. No. Okay. That's good. <laughs> Okay, all those in favor? And that passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to move to the committee uh, structure. So uh, I will, uh, there's no need now to do with, uh, make any decisions about the standing committees. That's corporate and community services or development and operations. Um, what I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to read out uh, the list that staff has prepared uh, for the uh, various positions. And then I'll seek uh, whether there's any particular ones that council members want to sever out for discussion or further nomination. Because uh, I know there's one. Okay. So uh, the motion, uh, so what's before us is um, that the standing committee, which is this one, recommend the following. Uh, so for boards and committees, library board, uh, that would be Councillor Perry. 
for Police Services Board, uh, Mayor Hamlin and Deputy Mayor Fryer, BIA Board, Councillor Houston, uh, Sports Hall of Fame, Councillor Potts, the, Con the Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority, Authority, Councillor Baines, and the Affordable Housing Task Force. There's three members there, and that would be Councillors Jeffrey, Doherty, and Ring. Um, so, yes, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin, and, uh, and I just want to make a couple of comments. Um, as you noted, uh, I'm down for the Police Services Board, and Councillor Jeffrey saved, has shared some information with us as, as council members in regards to her previous participation on the, on the Police Services Board. And um, I was thinking that I would not have a problem with switching from that board to the Affordable Housing Task Force, which is the position right now that uh, Councillor Jeffrey has been appointed or suggested to. Um, I, I feel that that would keep some continuity and yourself coming into that board as, an, as a new um, board member. That'll be helpful. Um, I also am very interested in your later motion in regards to the um, Economic Development Advisory Committee and and see some, um, uh, I would be very interested in participating once we decide, decide exactly how that's going to set up. Um, because I see some meshing together with that and also with uh, my preferences at the county. Uh, I've asked for the economic development as well and, and the audit and finance committee. So I thought those all kind of tied nicely together. So I am uh, willing, if uh, Councillor Jeffrey is willing, to, uh, to switch positions. Okay, Councillor Jeffrey. I would. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other uh, changes that council would like to speak to? Okay, seeing none. Uh, so with that, uh, okay. So I'll go one by one then. So for the first one then, uh, for the library board, uh, as I mentioned, for Councillor Perry, uh, can I, all those in, do I have to? Okay, mover and a seconder for Councillor Perry. Councillor Ring, Councillor Potts, all those in favor? Passed. Thank you. Uh, for the Police Services Board, uh, then we have before you uh, myself and Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, I need a mover and a seconder for that. Deputy Mayor and Councillor Ring. Uh, comments? All those in favor? Uh, the BAA board, that would be Councillor Councilor Houston. Houston um, comments? So moved. Oh, so moved. Seconder. Councillor Doherty, all those in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Sports Hall of Fame, uh, Councillor for Councillor Potts, uh, mover and a seconder. Councillor Jeffrey, uh, Councillor Perry, comments? All those in favor? Perfect appointment. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, for the Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority, Councillor Baines, uh, mover and a seconder. Councillor Jeffrey, Councillor Ring, comments? All those in favor? And that's approved. And lastly, the Affordable Housing Task Force. Uh, three here, that would be Deputy Mayor Fryer, Councillor Doherty, and Councillor Ring, mover and a seconder. Councillor Baines, Councillor Potts, comments? All those in favor? And that's passed. Thank you, everyone. Yes, Councillor Jeffrey. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. So just to comment that I'll still be working on the um, affordable housing files at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and, and staying in touch. And I think it's a great ad to have um, the Deputy Mayor with the county file at affordable housing as well. So We are going to move forward here. We're going to be a leader in Canada. I know it. Thank you, everybody. Okay, we'll go back to... Uh, our staff reports then. So we have a number before us today. The first one is 7.1. Uh, this is T20. Right, 218? It, that's wrong. I can't be right. Okay, 2022-18. Uh, it's our 2022 Q3 financial report and forecast. 
uh, and it's at staff report T2022-18, 2022 Q3 financial report and forecast be received for information. Uh, and I'll ask, uh, I guess that would be our treasurer, if she's here today, to do the presentation, please. I am here. Thank you, Your Worship. And I apologize for not um, being in person as well, because I do have a wee bit of a cold and... Um, thought it best to stay away from everybody in my office. So I'm going to present um, all of the reports that we have on the docket today um, virtually. Uh, so we'll start off. Uh, the very first one is T2022-18, which is our quarter three financial review. And just to give um, the new members of council a little background, we do um, provide a quarterly update as to the actual versus budget of the uh, current fiscal year. This year, our third quarter report's a little bit delayed just because of um, getting the new council in and, and bringing everybody up to speed. So normally you would see um, the third quarter late in October or early November. November. This year, we're a little bit behind that. But to give you an idea, um, for 2022, again, we um, worked through uh, most of the beginning of the year where the pandemic continued on and we had facilities that were closed again, um, not for the whole first quarter, but for most of the um, first quarter. So by the end of February, we were back to running sort of normal operation levels. Next slide, please. Um, again, and we've talked about it quite a bit throughout the year, there's been a lot of new challenges for staff. Uh, certainly, uh, supply chain issues is one of the major ones where um, things that are generally easily able to supply, we're not able to get quite at the same rate of speed as we have been able to in the past. And of course, as we all know, we've been talking about the inflationary pressures, especially with respect for uh, to the 2023 budget, but of course, have seen quite a bit of that in 2022 as well. Next slide, please. So what this um, slide shows you is um, essentially uh, a consolidated statement by um, division that shows um, exactly where uh, the year-to-date amount is, which is highlighted in yellow. Um, and then the green highlight or the third or fourth column over is what we project to the end of the year with the very first column um, representing the budget uh, that was passed for 2022. And I'll say that overall, uh, the, the town continues to be in a fair financial position. Um, what we're projecting at this point to be the surplus at the end of the year is about $180,000. I think if you look into the details of the staff report, you'll notice that this is significantly different than what we've seen in years past. And I'll say that a, a majority of the reason for that is that the approach to budgeting has changed considerably. And I would say most notably uh, in the amount that's included in the budget on an annual basis for supplemental taxation. Um, I'll also note that my previous forecast for the second quarter um, showed us at about uh, a $57,000 surplus. So it has increased about 130,000. And that's largely due to the fact that we did receive uh, an additional supplemental run this year um, that we weren't anticipating. Next slide, please. Uh, what you see in front of you now is the capital projection for uh, 2022. Again, the, high, the yellow highlighted column is where we're at today. So you can see we've spent about $8.5 million of a $51.7 million budget so far this year, um, with a projection that the total spending um, by the end of 2022 would be in the range of about $20 million. Um, uh, some, of uh, some of the projects that are currently that underway, underway uh, are the water, water treatment water plant expansion, expansion uh, of course, the mountain road, road upgrade. upgrade. We have the wastewater treatment, treatment plant treatment sludge transfer sludge replacements, replacements. Um, the OPP roof being roof completed as well, well, and of course, the Sunset the sun Point sun playground sun replacements. replacements. And that wraps up this presentation. Thank you very much. Would there be any members of the public uh, who would like to uh, address this? Nobody in person. Anyone online, Clerk Almas? Thank you, Your Worship. We do have uh, a few attendees participating remotely. If you wish to address the staff report, please press the raise your hand feature. Uh, there's no interest to speak to this staff report at this time, Your Worship. 
Thank you. So uh, before I turn it over to council, I'll just ask if Guy could have a mover and a seconder for this item. That would be Councillor Jeffrey, Councillor Doherty. Thank you. Uh, and I uh, see that Councillor Baines has a question. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Through you to uh, the Treasurer. Um, a question about the, and I'm a non accountant, the 184,000 projected surplus. Is that a credit that we could use in our 2023 budget discussions? Can we apply that 184,000 as a savings to the current budget discussions? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Director Quinn. Your Worship, to Councillor Baines. That is a it's a great question, and yes, if if Council so chose, we could um, reserve the funds at the end of 2022 to be applied to the 2023 budget. Generally, um, what has happened in the past is that it does, um, the surplus does get uh, sort of allocated to reserves on a, on, a, on a very precise basis in terms of what our each reserve category is um, sort of allocated to. And we're, we're gonna give you uh, an update on how reserves and reserve funds um, work, but it's certainly an option if, if council so, choose to, so chose to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. So through to the Treasurer, I was just curious, and I don't know why it just occurred to me now, is that $300,000 credit from um, the police policing contract, I, I, I was just wondering, why does it go into the 2023 budget if it's a refund on things that have been expensed up to and put in the, the rate payers' uh, amounts paid in up to the end of 2022, and would it not form part of the surplus? I don't know if we've always treated it that way, and I'm, I'm not sure why that question is just coming to me now, but I was I was just curious. Treasurer, go ahead. If I may, through you, your worship to Councillor Jeffrey. Um, I do understand what you're saying, uh, but generally, because of the way um, the OPP uh, adjust the reconciliation. The the it gets applied to our uh, future year um, billing um, advice. So essentially, what happens with that three hundred thousand that we saw? Now it wasn't all uh, part of the reconciliation. Some of that was just pure savings in terms of the cost per household going down and things like that. But essentially, what they do is they provide us what that amount will be for, and I'm going to use 2023 because that's what's coming up. And then they reduce whatever that number is by the reconciliation that they've done. In fact, it's for 2021. So it's almost two years ago. Um, so uh, and they adjust how they bill us for 2023 based on that. So given that at the timing of when things actually are received, um, we have always applied it sort of on a forward basis and more on a cash basis rather than an accrual basis. Any follow up? Uh, well, I, I'm. I think that maybe Councillor Baines is going to ask the same thing. But um, if they, it, if if it isn't actually an actual credit against our contract, it seems to me that the accrual basis probably makes more sense in terms of offsetting our expenses to date. And again, um, you're the treasurer, but it, it, to me, in my mind, it it, it just makes more sense that if we've already billed the taxpayers and it's from 2021 and we've already paid in that we're really offsetting the expenses up to not 2023. But anyway, I'll, I'll, that's kind of where I'm at, but I'll wait to hear what the others have to ask. Councillor Baines. I just, oh, sorry. Let's hear from the, the treasurer. Thank you. Sorry, if I may respond, your worship uh, to Councillor Jeffrey. I, I can hear what you're saying. I guess um, what happens is though, is the fact that the bill that um, we receive on a monthly basis throughout 2023 from the OPP takes this into consideration. So it says, um, here's what you owe for 2023 and we've adjusted your 2023 contract amount for the fact that um, you know, the reconciliation from 2021 came in as, as a net adjustment. So um, it would be difficult, um, although I suppose it, it, could, it could work that way, it's just, a matter of you know changing a, a bit of a, a a policy that we've always incorporated it as part of the new contract amount. Councillor Baines, go ahead. Uh, sorry, but on this point, uh, uh, Treasurer Quinlan, is this was this a one-off? This three hundred thousand, or could we expect 
uh, fingers crossed, that we would get any sort of similar offset from the OPP this coming year at the end of 2023 budget year? Go ahead, Treasurer. You may, through you, your worship to Councillor Baines. So just to be clear, the $300,000 difference in our OPP um, uh, contract costs isn't all based on the 2021 uh, reconciliation amount. I believe that number is about 120,000. I'd have to look at the, the actual file we received from um, the ministry. But um, what, uh, what it, it is possible that we would, we would see that 2023 was overpaid once the uh, ministry does their full reconciliation. But again, we won't know that until 2025 when they complete the information. So I think what, um, what maybe will be helpful is um, I could provide members of council for that matter, just a copy of what we receive from the OPP on an annual basis. And it would provide a little bit more clarity um, to what uh, to what we're presenting today. Thank you. Any other questions, Deputy Mayor? Okay, Councillor Doherty, you go first. Um, yes, thank you. Um, and this uh, question um, is uh, with regard to the um, variance on the capital budget. Um, so uh, you you do note that this will be carried over into 2023. Um, but I'm wondering, in the meantime, is there an opportunity for that um, 12 million or so, um, or maybe this is already being done, um, to be invested in short-term um, um, funds uh, so that it, that money, it, I mean, it's a significant amount of money so that it can in itself uh, work for the town and increase revenues? Go ahead, Treasurer Quinlan. Yeah. To Councillor Doherty, yes. The funds are, in fact, um, already invested. So uh, the we do have some in, in short-term GICs, but also some in long-term as well. So that is generating investment income for the for the town at this point. Follow up, please. Mm -hmm. So, and that's incorporated into 2023 budget. Go ahead, Treasurer. I may, Your Worship. Yes. Uh, as part of our our general government budget, you will see in it a line called investment income. A portion of that comes into the municipal levy uh, calculation, but there's also a portion that gets assigned directly to reserve funds because reserve funds. Um, generate their interest and and hold the interest. So the investment income you see um, within the municipal levy portion is strictly to just reserves or general reserves that aren't assigned their own um, interest allocation. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on this item? Deputy Mayor? Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin, and through you to the Treasurer, uh, just maybe a comment first, uh, because uh, she did mention that uh, there's planning to provide further information to Council in regards to reserves. There's some discussion about that in the in the budget report a little bit later. Um, so I, at this point in time, I was looking at the $184,000 projection, um, since it reads uh, under the surplus policy that uh, working capital reserve fund or operating contingency reserve are the ones that get topped up first to their target levels. Um, I was kind of considering it at this point in time that 184 is going kind of directly back to the 2023 budget because um, the terminals is using $250,000 of reserve, which will come from the working capital reserves. So we'll we'll have more discussion about reserves. But my question, and uh, and and I guess first uh, is in regards to a couple of the the larger differences on the report in in regards to environmental services. Um, it shows that the uh, expected uh, dollar amount at the end of the year is going to be four million two hundred seventy four thousand dollars as compared to budget of $3,405,000. So I'm expecting that down below where there's a non-tax supported adjustment, that's where that gets taken into account because the 184, I'm assuming, is a, is a tax-based um, uh, uh, surplus. And of course, uh, environmental services isn't, uh, isn't its user fees. 
And then the other part of the question was um, general government is about $340,000 more uh, for the end of the year than budgeted. So I just wondered if you could identify. It looked to me from the detailed report that part of it was uh, uh, lower revenue and the other was a little bit higher expense. I just wondered if you could uh, uh, explain the differences there. Yes, Director or uh, Treasurer Quinlan, answer those two questions, please. You sure can. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I threw you directly to uh, Dr Deputy Mayor Fryer. So to start out, yes, the um, with respect to the uh, non-tax supported adjustments, if you look at the line um, where it shows the non-tax supported adjustments, pardon me, 4,428,000, that removes any of the surplus that's generated from the building department, the parking department, and environmental services. So there's a little asterisk beside each of those. And it's explained in the in the bottom of the chart that we remove that information to come down to what um, a tax supported surplus would be. So that one hundred and eighty four thousand um, is purely for tax. Uh, with respect to general government, you are correct that there is um, a little bit of uh, difference in the um, in the income that's shown for uh, general government versus budget, largely in uh, the investment income category where uh, rates were not quite as um, advantageous at the beginning of the year, albeit they are getting better now as we um, carry on to the end of the year. Um, I am being a little conservative there because we don't know in total. Some of my uh, investments are market-based and um, certainly could uh, we could see sort of a, a reduction at in comparison to what we've seen in, in prior years. Um, from an expense uh, side, I'd have to uh, pull up my notes and I apologize, but I don't have the answer for you right in front of me right now, but I can certainly respond uh, from the expense side later on. All right, that's great. Any other questions or comments on this item? All right, so uh, then we are going to bring this to a vote that we receive this information for information. All those in favor? And that would be unanimous. Thank you. Um, we have two members uh, here in person today, and they're here for item 7.4. And I'm going to suggest, uh, unless any council member uh, has a different view, that we move item 7.4 to be the next item we discuss uh, so that they can uh, escape, escape from the chamber should they wish. Uh, but I expect that could be a longer discussion, and we've been here for over an hour and a half, so I'm going to uh, adjourn us for 10 minutes, and then we'll return. Thank you.
Thank you. So we we'll reconvening our strategic initiative standing committee meeting uh, at item 7.4. And this is the T2022-17-2023 budget draft number two and public feedback. Uh, what, uh, there's two uh, parts to this here, and I'm going to sever them. And the first item we're going to deal with is this, that staff report T2022-17, which is the 2023 budget draft number two, and public feedback be received. So I'm firstly going to turn this over to our treasurer for her presentation. Thank you, Your Worship. We do have a presentation coming up. Oh, apologies, uh, Kirk's department. It looks like the fees and service charges is up right now. And we're gonna move to There we go, great, thank you. And we can move right to the next slide, please. So here we go again. Um, I will uh, just walk through really quickly uh, our budget timeline, just to remind everybody on the process. So as part of, as we move throughout August, we launched our public survey, um, which asked residents what was important to them and began the submissions of budget requests. Um, moving into September, a staff report was provided giving an economic overview, and we held a staff workshop to review, um, rank, and prioritize the projects and or plans for 2023. And then in October, we brought a staff report forward that showed the results of the public survey and provided an initial overview of the major budget requests. And of course, ongoing meetings and work uh, were held with the entire team to refine and align projects with the um, current master plans. Next slide, please. In November, uh, we brought the first draft of the um, of the budget forward on November 23rd uh, to the SIC meeting. And then of course we held two, um, two public meetings, uh, a virtual session from one to three on November 28th, and then an in-person session um, that was held at the library from six to 8 p.m. So today we're at the December 5th um, SIC uh, meeting and we're presenting the second draft of the budget and a summary of the public response we received from the latest um, public meetings. Next slide, please. So just as a reminder, um, there are many steps involved in formulating a budget. It starts with input from staff, um, members of the public and members of council. We then look at the environment around us that we're operating in. We review future plans and ensure that anything we're planning for ties to those amounts and the changes that may prepare all of the budget documents. And then we um, provide pre or prepare uh, a document so that we can move into uh, the actual draft budget book that's been provided to members of council and, and to the public. And finally, um, we, we look for feedback. Um, staff did extensive work to ensure that all the budget changes were well vetted and could provide uh, value for taxpayers and our businesses prior to providing them for council's consideration and consultation with the public. And as we know, this is a continual process until we reach a budget that's fully approved by members of council. Next slide, please. So since we last met, uh, we have made one change to the budget uh, where the funding for the Arts Center Feasibility Study Phase 2, um, it was originally to be funded by the Arts and Culture Legacy Fund. However, in draft one, I had included it as part of the total municipal levy. Uh, in error. So this 60,000 changed the reduced tax rate by about 0.16%. Next slide, please. So again, um, the budget that we're being uh, Okay, my apologies. Is it better now? Okay. Um, so, uh, as we presented, uh, before we've broken the, uh, the proposed 2023 budget into two 
into two categories. Um, what we're going to start off with are the unavoidable changes. And these changes include items that both staff and council have limited control over. And they reflect things like inflationary impacts, contracts, and things of those nature. Um, including only these increases would amount to a tax rate uh, increase of 1.63%. And what this means is that the amount of tax that will be paid in 2023 will have increased by 1.63% over the prior year. Next slide, please. So this slide breaks down the information, um, both from a tax rate percentage increase and what it means uh, in terms of a median assessed household uh, for the town of Collingwood this year. So the top part of the, um, of the slide shows that the rate um, of the tax rate increase has gone up to 1.63% in 2023 over 2022. And you will see that the bottom uh, portion of the slide shows that over um, the tax amount paid on a, uh, a median assessed household of 327,000 is about is an increase of about $38. So when we talk about an increase um, from a tax rate perspective of 1.63%, uh, we're just going to use an example of a person paying normally uh, 2,500 in 2022. Again, if your tax bill last year was $2,500, when we increase that by 1.63%, you would see uh, that your taxes for 2023 would uh, increase to about $2,541. So that equates to about $3.42 per, uh, per month based on that increase for these unavoidable changes only. Next slide, please. Um, so this graph is a, is a slide that uh, members of council and members of the public have seen before. Essentially starts with uh, the municipal tax levy from back in, from, in, from 2022 at $36.8 million dollars. And it walks you through all the different items that are listed as unavoidable changes. Um, mainly, um, the highlights are salaries and benefits at 1.1 million, utilities and fuel in terms of inflation going up by 303,000, um, the grain terminal continuation, insurance um, increases for inflationary as well as repairs and maintenance on the building, on buildings. Um, so red is uh, a negative impact or an increase in the municipal levy, and green is a positive impact or a decrease in the municipal levy. So we talked earlier about the OPP contract reducing by 300000 and that amount is included as a reduction to the um, 2023 uh, levy from 2022. We had a salary contingency amount uh, included in our 2022 budget of 150000 that has been removed for 2023. And also our business accelerator has been removed for 2023 as well. So the, all of those things added together um, bring us to a proposed uh, municipal uh, levy of 38.3 million for 2023 with just the unavoidable increases. Next slide, please. I wanted to provide a little bit of context with respect to the economic environment that we're dealing with right now. Um, to start, uh, as we've talked about before, inflation is running at all-time highs. The current CPI at October was uh, at 6.5%. And back in 2021, or while we were uh, planning the 2022 budget, it was at 3.4%. That equates to nearly 10% over the last uh, two years. Additionally, the non-residential building construction price index for the third quarter for 2022 is at 15.6%. And back again in, in 2021, it was at 11.6%. So those two together equates to over 27% in the last two years. Um, in comparison, as we had noted earlier, uh, the town's tax rates between 2019 and 2022 have in fact decreased by 2.17%. Uh, and this means that even with an increase on the assessment of the median home back in 2019, the median household is paying only $6.66 more per year than they were four years ago. Next slide, please. While members of council and staff have worked together to reduce town needs and continue working to search for new opportunities for funding and reduce where opportunities arise, moving uh, forward, uh, this approach to inflation and taxes is not sustainable. 
if services are expected to remain at the same level. What this slide represents is some examples of the efficiency gains that have been included in the 2023 draft budget, um, including a, a change in the outdoor rink equipment storage, um, rink or, or reorganization of the finance department, introducing uh, non-resident parking fees, um, including an administrative fee in the new Tecumseh uh, water agreement and a fees and service review for the development process. Next slide, please. So as we talked before, we've prepared this um, budget with two, uh, with two categories. The first was unavoidable changes. And the second list of items are uh, items for council's consideration. Um, these include service enhancements, uh, previous council resolutions that are um, already in motion or have been um, requested, and some adjustments to service levels. The total of these amount uh, to 1.3 million and are within council's control. The impact that these changes have on the municipal tax rate is an additional 3.52%, which would bring the total tax rate to a 5.15% increase. And that's if both the unavoidable changes and all items for consideration were included. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide is similar to the one we just uh, reviewed for unavoidable changes. Again, uh, the top part of the, of the slide uh, shows you what the impact is to the actual tax rate year over year. So you can see in 2023, if we included all the avoidable, unavoidable changes and items for consideration, it would mean a tax rate increase of 5.15% um, over 2022. If we look at the total increase from 2019 to 2023, the cumulative tax rate increase is just under 3%. Um, and the, with respect to the impact that that would have on a median assessed household over the last five years, that would equate to about $128 or, or approximately $25 per year. Next slide, please. Again, this graph um, has been shown before and is included in the budget book, and I won't go through each individual item, but it does represent uh, the changes that are, are listed as items for consideration. Working from the left side of the graph to the right, um, the 38.3 million is the starting point um, from the, which includes the unavoidable changes that were presented earlier. And it walks us through to uh, the proposed uh, 2023 um, cap or uh, municipal levy at $39.7 million. Again, red is a negative impact to um, the overall uh, municipal levy and green is a positive impact. Next slide, please. So just to summarize what we've presented so far, um, each percentage point of taxation equates to approximately $375,000 in taxes collected. Uh, the total change in the tax levy from 2022 to 2023 for unavoidable changes only is an amount of about 1.6 million or a tax rate impact of 1.63%. This is inclusive, inclusive of growth that we've included at 2.55%. Um, the total change in the tax levy from 2022 to 2023 with respect to items for consideration is uh, 1.3 million and has a tax rate impact of 3.52%. Next slide, please. So as part of the ongoing public engagement, uh, members of council and staff held two public meetings that we referred to earlier on, on November 28th. Uh, the events were well attended in comparison to, pr uh, to prior years with staff estimating approximately 65 attendees between the two um, meetings. To encourage discussion and dialogue, staff provided a poll for attendees to fill out um, both virtually and in person. Not all attendees chose to fill out the poll. However, between the two meetings, 22 responses were received. Again, although the information you're about to review is not considered statistically significant, given that only a very, very small portion of the population attended and um, completed the document, uh, staff feel that the details can be helpful when trying to fully understand the relevant issues and learn and hear how some of the public uh, feels. The poll included 13 questions, mainly surrounding the items for consideration that we noted earlier. Um, each question was framed as follows. Do you support? And then it included the item um, for consideration. And the full poll is attached um, as Appendix B for, to the staff report. 
So to summarize the data, um, the graph that you see here um, shows the results of each question. The blue columns represent the yes responses. The red columns represent the no, resp the no responses. And the gray column, and I likely should have changed the wording on this, are where we didn't receive a response with respect to that question. So um, gray is sort of um, eliminated from the, the overall information, but it does share how many um, did not respond to that uh, particular question. So the first question was with respect to um, the asset management plan and the additional funding that were, was included as an item for consideration. 59% um, of the respondents were in favor of this funding. Um, and as we noted before, there's pressures on the life cycle reserve as we're increasing for our non-core assets, especially. The next, uh, the second question was with respect to whether the master transportation plan was supported. Of the respondents, 64% um, uh, were in favor of this funding. The third question is the greenhouse gas uh, reduction pathway feasibility study. And 55% 55 of the respondents were in favor of this funding. Uh, the next one is the study and the survey to assist council in formulating an updated strategic plan. And 73% of the respondents were in favor of this funding. The fifth question was uh, with respect to the urban forestry unit plan. And 55% of the respondents were in favor of this funding. Um, we also had the second application of pavement markings. Um, and 68% of the respondents were in favor of this funding. The additional software support to assist um, in making the town's website more accessible and user-friendly, as well as adding some social media tracking software, 73% of the respondents were in favor of this funding. And finally, um, we asked the question of whether people were generally happy with the uh, services they received from the town, and 86% of the respondents selected yes to, the, to this question. There are a few questions that I skipped over here because we did receive more no responses than yes. Um, and we thought it might be a little easier to, to split that out and, and help uh, members of council understand. So the uh, heritage services review, which you can see on the slide is uh, question number five, uh, only received 36% of the respondents in favor of this funding. The drone show, um, which is represented as number eight, only received 18% of respondents being in favor of this funding. And finally, um, the UN UEF uh, funding question, which is number nine on the, on the graph, showed that only 36% of the respondents were in favor of this funding. Next slide, please. Um, two other questions were included. Uh, the first was with respect to affordable housing. And the question was posed as follows, understanding that a single point of taxation equates to about $375,000, do you believe the funding for affordable housing should be included in the budget at $350,000, $125,000, or zero? The res results of this are summarized uh, on the graph um, and are noted as 55% declaring that $350,000 is appropriate, 32% um, declared that $125,000 was appropriate, and 9% declared that zero was appropriate. And there were about 5% of the respondents that did not indicate a response. Next slide, please. So as part of the public engagement sessions, there were um, questions and comments following that, and staff have prepared some analysis to, com uh, to compare the tax rates and taxes paid across Simcoe County. It's important to note, however, uh, that there are many differences across municipalities that need to be considered in order for a direct comparison to be meaningful. Um, so these differences can include the Ontario Municipal Partnership Funding, which is the OMPF. Um, and this funding comes from the province. It's unconditional operating support. And um, over 380 municipal um, municipalities receive it. It uses an equalization approach to address challenges in rural and Northern communities with funding based on various community fiscal health indicators. What's interesting is that all municipalities in Simcoe County receive this funding at some level with only the town of Collingwood being excluded from this list. Um, the town that is often used as a, as a comparable um, for the town of Collingwood is Wasaga Beach, for example, 
who does receive this funding in the past. Uh, this funding has been over $2 million. However, for the 2022 um, year, the amount is set at $1.3 million. So significantly different um, for a comparator. The next item that we often uh, like to look at when we're trying to compare tax rates is the age of, um, or pardon me, the type of assessment within the town. And when we look at um, tax rates and how a town balances their tax rates and their assessment, it's important to understand the differential between commercial, industrial, and residential assessment. Um, it's especially important because uh, commercial and industrial um, sectors have higher tax ratios and can help to relieve the burden from the residential tax base. For the town of Collingwood, we do have a greater commercial base than some of our neighboring municipalities. However, in contrast, the town has a very low industrial base, which um, can cause some uh, major differences when it comes to the tax rate calculation. The third item we'd like to consider when we look at comparing tax rates is the age of in infrastructure. Um, the town of Collingwood has been incorporated for over a century, which means that much of the infrastructure has aged considerably, which we've talked a lot about um, when it comes to the asset management plan. And when an analyzing tax rates, it's really important to consider both the age of the town and what that means for the age of the infrastructure. Uh, for those towns that might be considered to be younger, they have the advantage of generally having younger assets and we're able to start their asset management plans with much less backlog or delay. And finally, I think one of the most important um, factors to consider when we are comparing tax rates is services offered. So for example, do they have a transit system and what's the level of service that they provide? Does the town provide a fully accessible system as well? Um, how many recreation facilities they may have? Or is there more than one pool or more, uh, more ice rinks? Is there a curling club or the things when we compare the town of Collingwood to other municipalities? What's the level of, air, uh, level of service that's provided with respect to streetscape and active transportation? And maybe what the level of service is for cleaning the roads? All, the, all municipalities have a different um, approach to these uh, types of uh, opportunities and levels of service are extremely important when we compare tax rates. Next slide, please. So um, this chart uh, details the differences in both the 2022 total tax rates, which is um, the, uh, the X or the Y axis on the left hand side, and the total taxes paid on a median assessed home of 320,000, inclusive of the county and education tax rates from lowest to highest uh, in Simcoe County. And we've also included a, a few of our uh, great county uh, neighbors as well. The town is the fifth highest amongst, amongst its peer municipalities within the range provided, and it's approximately $409 per year higher than the average taxes paid, or $34 a month. Again, however, I would urge you to take uh, into consideration the differences amongst towns and also reflect on what a taxpayer may be willing to accept in terms of offering programs and services. Next slide, please. So following our November 23rd SIC meeting, uh, there were many questions that were posed by members of council and uh, the next few slides are gonna provide some information to address those. Um, the first question was with respect to uh, the urban forestry unit and requesting some additional analysis on that. Um, staff have met to discuss and analyze the proposed urban unit and will provide an updated response as part of the third draft of the budget. Similar uh, response for a transit coordinator position it was requested that um, staff confirm some details of the proposed support from our partner municipalities and staff are working on that now with the hopes again that we can provide an update to the third draft of the budget. Next slide, please. Uh, another question that was posed is what the impact of the proposed increase for the special capital levy and as part of the second draft um, staff proposed increase the uh, increasing the special capital levy from 300,000 to $315,000. For a median assessed home, this means a change of about 45 cents per year and uh, creates the amount of this tax being collected at $19.60 uh, uh, for the 2023 year. This addition was included as uh, part of a list of options to help assist us in closing the funding gap on the asset management plan. Next slide, please. Um, we also uh, were requested that uh, confirmation that the MLEO2 position uh, and, and uh, understand if it was appropriately funded. 
We did uh, confirm that the uh, position is partially funded by parking and the 55,000 that was being uh, shown as a municipal tax impact was correct, in fact. Next slide, please. Another question that was posed is what the impact of the proposed 3.5% increase in the County of Simcoe's levy would be on the taxpayer in total, inclusive of um, the municipal tax levy increase. If everything presented was included, um, unavoidable changes, and all items for consideration in the municipal levy, it's noted above that the municipal portion of a resident's tax bill would change by about $121 on a median assessed home. Uh, the total impact of the tax changes um, inclusive of the county and the school board for 2023 would be $141.96 or about $11.80 per month. Um, this table shows uh, the amounts per item. So you can see the very top part of the table is the town of Collingwood general tax rate at $121. Um, we just spoke about the special capital levy and how the increase would be um, 45 cents over 2022. And then what we show as an estimated uh, increase for the County of Simcoe would be $31.94. And of course, because the school boards work a little differently and are on a notional rate, they will reduce by $11.44. Next slide, please. Uh, another question that we uh, wanted to address, is there enough funding included for the second round of pavement markings to include Sixth Street as well as bike lanes? So at this time, uh, the budgeted amount that we included was 27,000 and it, it covered um, the arterial roads, Highway 26 East and West, Hume, Huron, Ontario and High Streets and Mountain Road. Um, where bike lanes are present on these sections of road, they are included in the budgeted amount noted. There is a small section of Sixth Street that is classified as arterial as well um, uh, between High Street and 10th Street. And if it were included, that amount we uh, if we included that amount, we would need to increase the twenty seven thousand uh, by about fifteen hundred dollars. Next slide, please. Um, uh, another question is: Was High Street included as a project in the twenty twenty three capital budget? Um, the long story short here is that, in fact, no, there are no works proposed for High Street in the twenty twenty three budget. I will say that there are two development charge uh, related projects with respect to this road. The first is from Poplar to 10th Street, an upgrade and widening. And the second is from 3rd to 5th Street, a widening from four lanes to five, along with some intersection improvements um, that are being looked at as part of the 10-year capital plan. The 10-year capital plan is still um, under scrutiny, scrutiny and being reviewed and is planned uh, to be provided at the third uh, draft of budget deliberations. And thus uh, the timing is still to be confirmed of when this work would be warranted. Additionally, I would note that according to the pavement condition index measurements taken in 2019, which helps to formulate our asset management plan, the average PCI for that road is just above 90. And there are two sections um, between first to third street that call for crack sealing in this year. Next slide, please. Another question that was raised was whether we purchase gently used vehicles. Uh, most of the heavy and light duty uh, trucks we are we use are customized significantly. So generally we are purchasing uh, new vehicles. However, that being said, when new vehicles are purchased, mun municipalities have historically received a manufacturer's discount from the factory. Um, these discounts can be several thousand dollars on fleet items such as standard pickup trucks and brings the tendered price well below retail prices for new vehicles. You, as we all know, supply chain issues have severely impacted vehicle manufacturers' ability to meet demand, and as a result, it has recently been suggested that the manufacturer's discounts may not continue in the short term. However, we're optimistic that this type of discount will be introduced when the market adjusts. Additionally, in the last few years, the used vehicle market has also become extremely competitive because of the shortage of new vehicle supply. So prices in the, uh, the used vehicle market are driven by demand and discounts are not usually applicable. Um, overall, fleet vehicles are in short supply and in high demand, new or used at this point. Next slide. Uh, so one of the uh, final questions that we were asked is what the impact on the water rates um, were for the proposed water distribution operator. Um, the water in the wastewater system is a self-sustaining one or a non-tax supported division. 
Uh, the rates that are currently in place were brought forward through an updated rate study back in 2019. Um, report uh, PW 2020 uh, 04 shows a, a, the full details of this. Um, generally, rate studies occur every five years or earlier if there are substantial changes to a system. And staff plan on updating the water study in late 2023 or early 2024 in advance of the water treatment plant expansion being completed and to accommodate the large amount of growth and inflationary increases that have occurred over the past several years. Uh, the recommendation on the rate study were very comprehensive and resulted in the fixed rate portion of the water rates increasing by 1% each year and the consumption-based uh, portion by 3% each year. And these rates, um, these upgrade, updated rates have been followed each year in accordance with the plan. The request to add a water distribution operator is premised on the, on the following details. Um, six water distribution operators, including the lead, has been maintained since 2012. But since this time frame, the length of the town's water mains has grown by over 12%. The annual hydrant flushing program has increased by 37%. The number of valves requiring maintenance has increased by over 18%. And we're also starting to see a trend in more water main and water service failures as the infrastructure ages, which requires the mobilization of crews to repair quickly to prevent significant property, environmental, or health and safety damages as a result of the water. Based on the data from the study, staff prepared a reconciliation, which was included in the um, staff report. Um, again, we note that with respect to the water and wastewater system, there is no profit generated. All uh, amounts are accumulated as net revenues received are put into a reserve fund to ensure that the system can be maintained, rehabilitated, and replaced into the future. And thus, the review of the re reserve funds um, provides us evidence when an updated study is needed. The details that were provided in the staff report show that the water system was behind the projected reserve balance by approximately 1.5 million. Um, again, most of that came in for 2022 and 2023 as part of a, um, a forecasted amount. In contrast, the wastewater system is ahead by nearly 4 million in comparison to what the, the project or the projected study showed. I think what's really important to understand and convey is that there are many, many variables when a study like this is completed. It's, a, it's based on forecasted expenses, capital works, and of course, the amount of water that will be sold. It isn't um, particularly unusual for things to vary. However, it's still very important that we continue to um, review and understand the impacts that could happen in the future. Next slide, please. And I think we're ready for questions or discussion. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, before I turn to council, uh, I'm going to see if there are members uh, in the gallery who would like to speak. And I, I know that Mr. Ireland is there. Good afternoon. Is that on? Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, my name is Paul Ireland. Uh, I've been here once before, twice before. And uh, this afternoon, I uh, want to introduce you to my friend, uh, Casey Morrison. And Casey's got a, a request to make. And go ahead and make your speech, Casey. Thanks. Came to us. You do not stop the on demand service with these caps until you can supply the same service with Landmark. It leaves a lot of us in wheelchairs without any transportation that we have had for 15 years. So, this upsets me. Um, what Casey is referring to is the uh, on-demand door-to-door request for transportation that uh, can happen on a, a on a daily basis, or or certainly with uh, with short notice. Um, and it's come to my attention that the on-demand door-to-door transport service for residents of Collingwood uh, will be put on hold for the foreseeable future, effective December the fifteenth. That's only ten days from today. Uh, Casey is one of the persons requiring this service every day and would tell you that, it, that, that this is a desperate issue. This needs resolution uh, before the, the December 15th date. Um, 
The service has been available since 2007 for the aforementioned residents with disabilities that require special transportation service around town on a daily basis. Um, it's my understanding that the transition to a new provider will not be ready for December the 15th, specifically for the on-demand door-to-door service. Um, I'm also told it's hearsay, so I didn't put it in my little document, but uh, that um, the service that they're going to get in the interim period could be anywhere from two to five days prior notice or prior requests. And that uh, certainly is not anything close to reasonable. I recognize, though, that the new, new town council has inherited this issue, and um, there's been very little time available to rectify the problem. However, this is not an acceptable situation, especially in consideration of the difficulties faced by the people uh, with disabilities during the winter months and any other time for that matter. Uh, upon review of the agenda from the last meeting of the Accessibility Advisory Committee, November the 17th, 2022, this issue does not appear to have been dealt with, much to my surprise. It, it, it wasn't on their agenda. In addition, um, Collingwood Town Council is, is directly responsible for administering and completing the newest updates to the Accessibilities for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, OADA, uh, all of which are, uh, are due on January the 1st, 2025. This has been an ongoing program since I believe it was 2005 or 2006, thereabout. And, um, uh, and now we're getting close to, the, to meeting all of the requirements. But um, uh, the issue of the, the uh, on-demand door-to-door transportation seems to be headed in the wrong direction, at least temporarily. So I respectfully request that Council be in contact with ACE Cabs to continue the service until the smooth transition to the landmark Sinton can be completed. What do you do, Casey? <laughs> any questions? Council, any questions of uh, Mr. Ireland or uh, Mr. Morrison? Councillor Doherty, go ahead. Thank you. Got to read my mind, not my card. Uh, um, through you, actually, I'm going to uh, address this question um, to staff uh, after saying that um, to thank uh, Mr. Ireland um, and Mr. Morrison for coming forward and flagging this issue. Um, we, this municipality um, has been uh, very much a leader in our progress uh, in AODA uh, requirements. And uh, so this would uh, definitely be a significant um, backfall uh, if, if this were to happen. And uh, generally, I, just, I think that it would be unacceptable um, considering the service that we have been able to provide for all these years. Um, so my question is, um, how long do we anticipate that um, this uh, delay in implementation for door-to-door uh, -door on demand uh, will, will uh, occur? Who would be able to uh, answer that question? E.O. Skinner. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Councillor Doherty. Um, so the door-to-door -door service still exists and will exist on the first day. Uh, the question is, how long ahead would you need to book that service? Uh, so previously with the Red Cross, it had been uh, two, three plus days. Um, we are hoping that we will be able to uh, beat that standard and hopefully transition to uh, same-day booking. Uh, we have also procured the on-demand software, the services, the people, the vehicles uh, for the on-demand service. Uh, they're not yet implemented. So there's going to be a couple of steps to do the, uh, the on-demand immediate taxi type of service. Uh, the other item is uh, the hours of duration. Uh, so the service that's being put in place is the same as the bus service. Uh, which goes till nine o'clock at night and starts again at seven o'clock in the morning. So overnight, there there's no bus service and there's no um, 
uh, on-demand uh, accessible uh, service uh, moving forward. Um, I think that's that's what I can give you today. Thank you. Oh, uh, go ahead. Uh, pardon me. I did want to add the one one other thing that slipped my mind. Um, the requirements of the Ontarians with Disabilities Act are met by uh, the proposed uh, service that's being provided by the town. Um, that doesn't mean that council, you know, might want to look at enhancements to that service. But with respect to the legislative services and what's being provided in uh, in Collingwood, it does uh, it does meet the legislative requirements, and in most, if not all, cases, is uh, much better than that being offered by municipalities. Uh, close by this one. Thank you. Uh, was there a follow up? Um, no, I'll um, I'll just consider that response and let uh, anybody else um, ask their questions. <coughs> Councillor Baines, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, through you, your worship, to CAO Skinner. So, uh, case in point, uh, to Mr. Ireland's statement about what will happen on December 15th. You're saying that is not actually correct, that we will have on-demand service as of December the 15th? CEO? Um, I, through you to Councillor Baines, um, I hope I didn't misspeak. What I meant to say was we will have door-to-door -door service, but the on-demand component will come as soon as we can get the software and the uh, um, new staff training up and running. So Thank you will need to to pre-book. I think I did misspeak. Thank yeah, you for asking. Thank you for that. And any idea on when you think the sort of kinks would be worked out so that, um, yeah, they, they could do on demand as of, I don't know, January the 15th or? Um, through the chair, uh, I don't know tonight. The uh, director in question is, is not present. Uh, we can follow up though to, uh, to let folks know um, in short order around uh, how soon we think we can get that up and running, but it will take a little time. I can't commit to the 15th or earlier or later, and I know there's some people who rely on it, and it is important. Uh, uh, yeah, I just, I'm looking for clarification. Uh, you know, how long are we going to be without the service that they had leading up to December the 15th? And if it's one month, two months, three months, whatever the time frame is, could you continue with ACE cabs? until Landmark is ready to take it over and, and restore or at least continue the service as they've known it for Mr. 15 Ireland, years. We're just in the council part of the meeting now, so we heard you, so uh, you can't speak right now, basically. But thank you, we heard you. Uh, thank you. Um, Councillor Ring? I just, uh, when we were talking previously, and, and I thought it was brought up when uh, this, this topic was discussed at, at, at length um, <clears throat> there was an issue at the time that and I, and I and correct me if I'm wrong um, through you to I guess uh, CAO is did we not have an issue with ace cabs not prepared to go past that deadline was there something said about that there there CEO Skinner can you answer that um, thank you your worship through you mm. to uh, Councillor Ring. Um, we did have some negotiation with the uh, ACE cabs previously. I know that they were stretched and had some trouble with their, with their staffing. Uh, we have been uh, paying them uh, uh, $7,500 a month to continue that service on top of the fees that are paid by the users of the service. So we would need to, um, uh, if Council directed it, uh, we'd need to negotiate on whether the, it, the service can be continued, and if so, at what price? Just a follow up. Yes, go ahead. And I, I think it was a, a staff shortage with ACE. They didn't know of the manpower to continue. Uh, yes, I believe so. They've provided a lot of good services in our community for uh, for many years, but it was becoming challenging, and it was I I understand personnel potentially other other issues of costs of running the business. Any other uh, questions uh, from Council? Councillor Doherty? Uh, thank you, Chair. And actually, um, this uh, question would be through you to Mr. Ireland. Um, uh, because I'm just, uh, sorry, I think I uh, misunderstood. So what is the lead time now for service? Door to door. Oh, uh, I... 
look, it's an estimate on my part, but what, what uh, Casey has ind indicated to me, the service in the past has been like 15 to 30 minutes to get to the door and then take them to, the, uh, to their destination. Um, like ordering a cab, right. you know. And, yeah. Uh, that's the level that it was at. Am I, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, is it okay if I comment here? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so, um, you know, the, the commitment from the town has been at a very high level, and I, I recognize that. I know that uh, Collingwood has done the absolute best they can do under all circumstances. Um, but I do also know that there's, uh, there's about, and, and it's a sm it might sound like a small sample size, but it, it wouldn't matter if it was one person or 15 people. It is about 15 people that require this service, but the town's commitment to accessibility at, uh, at the highest level for all citizens or residents of this town is that you should be able to get to a place from A to B in, in the same amount of time as you or I could, bottom line. And uh, if, if, if we have to wait for uh, ACE cabs to be replaced, then we need an alternative in the interim. Fair enough? Thank you. Okay. Okay, I think those are all our questions of you, and thank you for your presentation. Councillor Doherty, do you have one more comment? Yes, um, yeah, so because there are still some outstanding questions and certainly there are some concerns, I'm, I'm wondering if I could um, ask for uh, Council's support to uh, request um, a report from staff as to um, what specifically we're looking at um, as of December 15th, uh, what our lag time may be, and so on. So just so that we have some uh, hard numbers as to um, uh, what the considerations are, and then if it if it appears that it's it's not accessible or it's a such a it's a very dramatic drop in our service that maybe we can consider some short term alternatives. Would that be fair? Yeah. The facts. Facts and options. Yeah. Okay. Could I have a seconder for that? Uh, would that be a motion, Councillor Baines? Thank you. Any other discussion on this? Deputy Mayor? Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, earlier, I spoke about a, a, a disqualifying interest uh, regarding these cabs. I've continued to listen into the discussions. I don't believe there's any formal decision being made. Uh, a fact-finding uh, endeavor is, is is fine. So I've decided that I'm okay to participate through through that. I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for bringing that motion forward. I think. Uh, no one wants to, uh, you know, have less service for our uh, members of our community who need accessible uh, transportation. So I'm looking forward to getting an update from staff and some options. And Mr. Ireland and Mr. Morrison, thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. Thank you for your time. I and we'll really vote. Appreciate All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Unanimous. Chair. Yes, go ahead. Just, I'm going to... I'm going to distinguish myself as a yappy one tonight. I just uh, wanted to um, clarify that when I was um, making reference to um, the, the town's progress on um, AODA um, requirements, that I was I'm not suggesting that the alternative that is uh, presently in in place would be less than that. It goes without saying. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, Clerk Almas, can you see if there would be anyone in the in the online gallery who might like to uh, address council on this budget item? Thank you, Your Worship. We do have a couple of attendees participating remotely. If you wish to address the standing committee regarding today's budget discussions, please press the raise your hand feature. No interest at this time, Your Worship. 
Thank you. So as I mentioned, I'm dividing this into uh, two parts. So the first motion, I'll be looking for a mover and a seconder. That staff report T2022-17, being the 2023 budget draft number two and public feedback be received. Councillor Ring and Deputy Mayor Fryer, thank you. Uh, any comment on that? And we'll bring this to a vote. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, the second item here, uh, and further, that staff prepare draft number three of the 2023 budget and exclude or adjust the following items. Um, so do I bring that to the... Okay. So what we'll do is, uh, before we uh, have a mover and a seconder for that, we'll just see if there's any items that council wishes to add uh, to this or speak to. For a point of clarification. Yes. Um, your worship, which are the items that we're going to, which page was that for excluding? I think I know what they are, but. I, I think this is the avoidable and the, uh, you know, the right. discretionary items. It's that list. Oh, the treasurer could speak to this. Thank you, Treasurer Quinlan. Please, please help us. Thank you, Your Worship. So if you would want to um, refer to page five of the report, it lists out the items for consideration. I suspect that would be um, where we could start, uh, starting with asset management plan funding, the urban forestry unit, and, and going down that list. That might be the easiest way. Or um, if you wanted to use the budget book um, page, let me just get to it, sorry. Uh, page 15 of the PDF version listed out there as well. And then the graph uh, graphical presentation is on page 12. the software update at 32,000. I'll just put those on the table at this point. Thank you. Uh, I... Could I have a seconder to put that on the table for discussion, please? Councillor Doherty, thank you. Uh, any comments? Or perhaps, Councillor Baines, you'd like to address them yourself to start, or would you like to go last? No, I can start. Thank you. Um, uh, once again, as I said in the survey response and in public uh, people's comments about that the heritage review may be necessary, but perhaps not at this point, not this year coming up. Uh, the drone show itself, um, that seemed to have been the most uh, favored item to perhaps forego. Not to say it's a bad thing, but when the time comes, this is going to be a challenging year as it is. Um, uh, the UN UEF, uh, we've done it three years in a row, as I understand, and it's from, I won't say from failing hands pass we the torch. I will say, though, it's perhaps time to let others step up and show leadership in this regard. The software, uh, I'm only suggesting, and I'm sure that we'll hear from staff that this could be a challenge, uh, particularly in those aspects of implementing, um, as I understand it, uh, accessible uh, utilization of communicating with us. Uh, I'm certainly open to that discussion. Um, there are other items too, but I will just leave it at that at this point. Thank you. 
Uh, would anyone like to comment on any of these items? Or have any questions? Councillor Doherty? Uh, thank you. Um, I uh, was thinking um, exactly the same uh, as um, Councillor Bain, uh, which is why I was um, able to so quickly to second his motion. Um, I uh, recognize that um, a heritage review uh, is something that we are going to have to consider, um, but we have made some progress uh, this year, I think, on heritage with our the improvement mm -hmm. of our um, bylaw. Um, and uh, also um, with the uh, enhancement to the um, tax incentive uh, for heritage uh, restoration, so you know we've we've made some advancements. So it, perhaps we could put further advancements in the, in advance this year, um, with a view to having another look at it next year. Um, with regard to the uh, drone show, um, it was I who had originally asked uh, for staff um, to compare the notion of uh, eliminating fireworks and also to survey the public, I should say, uh, as to um, their um, evaluation of fireworks and also to provide an estimate of the cost of the drone show. Um, so I would be um, certainly willing to uh, forego or to suggest that the town could forego that this year. Uh, but further to that, I would suggest that the town could consider foregoing fireworks, period. Mm. Um, and that would uh, free up another 15000 um, of course, I'm saying that um, before we hear from the public, um, but um, I would be disingenuous if I didn't suggest that if we're going to forego a drone show, then we should forego fireworks. Uh, certainly, um, in support of the notion of um, at least interrupting our mm -hmm. support of the UN um, Urban Economic Forum um, World Summit funding, um, I think it had been always anticipated, or certainly I had as a member of the previous council, that um, there would be more assistance uh, coming to us uh, from them um, in terms of uh, helping us to put this um, forum on. And um, so there are lots of other municipalities and individuals participating. Uh, so perhaps it is time for another municipality to step up. Um, so fully an endorsement of that. Um, also um, supportive of the... Um, um, social media uh, software for communications to um, postpone that acquisition this year. Um, it's not as though uh, we, I mean, I realize that media and social media monitoring is getting more and more complex year by year. Um, but that said, we have uh, two very confident, competent, and confident uh, staff in that role, and um, I believe that we can uh, continue to do what we're doing and continue to make the improvements that we have already made with without that acquisition for this year. Um, what was the other one? Oh, um, I did have a question as to whether the AV coordinator um, um, estimate here of 42,000 uh, could be eliminated if or reduced at least if we were to consider a contract service uh, as opposed to uh, baking in um, an, another staff this year. Okay. So I guess that's a question. Yeah. CEO Skinner, would you be able to answer that? Or this was a question for Clerk Almas. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Worship. So this is something that, uh, again, we haven't found the exact location, but it came out of a request from the overtime and, and whatnot that's happened under clerk services with the hybrid meeting solution. So it is actually something that we're exploring right now uh, to see if we can provide, um, if there's a contract service provider that could provide um, what we're looking for. So hopefully we'll have that information whenever this report comes back on December the 19th. Super. Okay, great. Uh, so, and... Um, the uh, urban forestry unit um, that is still kind of in process uh, until the third draft of the budget, correct? Is that correct? Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, did you want to clarify that, CEO Skinner? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yes, staff have been doing some uh, additional analysis on options for the urban forestry unit, including in-house or other opportunities uh, to get that work done. Great. Okay. Thank you. So um, those are my comments. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Perry. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I do have a question on, on the um, full-time arborist. Is there not an opportunity to um, share knowledge? Or I know Simcoe County has a huge amount of regional forest. Sharing that with per perhaps other municipalities in the area and... Um, or um, cross-training existing staff in that position. I know it's a, it's a touchy subject because we've had a half a million dollar donation for the tree canopy. So a full-time arborist seems to make sense. I'm just wondering if some of that knowledge that the region has can be shared with, with us. Yeah, I think this is, uh, it might be exactly why staff's uh, going to be reporting further to us, but uh, C.O. Skinner, could you comment? Thank you, Your Worship, and through you to Councillor Perry. I think these are uh, some of the items that staff have been looking at. Um, Director Culver is on the line if you wanted a couple more uh, bits of information, or we can pull it back when we uh, get together next uh, to talk about the budget. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, there we have we have Director Culver. Right, right, we see your small face there on the screen. <laughs> Would you like to uh, offer some information now on this, please? Yeah, sure. It's the very first time that my head's ever been called small, so I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you, Mary Hamlin. Um, so... Certainly, we're looking at all options, and there's been a lot of um, intense conversations over the last week or so around the forestry division possibility. And, and I think the very first thing to understand is that um, an arborist is not providing advice, they're providing boots on the ground. And there is a task list that's been identified um, at at least 150 uh, items to be dealt with, um, which has never moved. That That list has remained... 150 items and this has to do with you know physical tree maintenance um, tree removal where it's necessary tree assessment um, all which require the credentials of an arborist uh, or somebody who has uh, gone through that education and training to be able to do that um, certainly uh, Simcoe County is a great resource for sort of that high level big picture knowledge and uh, and we do have relationships with Simcoe County which can help with that um, but what the proposal uh, includes is um, uh, something of a much more specific order. Um, it's really Collingwood making the decision to either move into uh, forestry management or managing the green assets that it has um, or not. And that's sort of, I think, uh, what, what our discussions have been around um, as we try to help council with information related to this item. Thank you. Uh, that's uh, very helpful to hear that. So we'll look forward to the report coming back with the, the uh, third draft of the budget. Uh, any other comments? Yes, Councillor. Uh, yeah, just a comment on, uh, uh, sorry, through you to, I guess, CAO uh, Skinner. We got uh, uh, an update, an operational update from you today, and you mentioned in there that the uh, the Urban Economic Forum asking for is 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 more than the fifty dollars that budgeted and in and correct then it could be as mentioned as much as two hundred and forty thousand dollars. I'm I'm thinking maybe a good time to take a step back and personally 
trim the budget a little bit, I think this would be a good time to maybe take a step back. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other comments on Mr. Baines or Councillor Baines' list? Yes, Councillor um, Baines. If this passes, and I know these are challenging cuts, and I would say to, uh, by the way, Director Culver, that this would be, I would say, a deferral if we were to do, when the time comes, that the um, arborist, at least in my opinion, we're just talking this year. There's also another item that, um, which is more, quote, controversial, if you will, that I looked at, which is uh, the 97750 to the asset management plan. Um, Treasurer Quinlan had two items, 314000 off of the, the, to bring the 900 thousand shortfall and then a second uh, item which was specifically the asset management plan for ninety seven thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars and if we were to be really ruthless in making some cuts i would suggest perhaps at a different motion about that item because i'm actually trying to find money if you will to top up the affordable housing one and so we're trying to make cuts here to come up with the dollars to put into affordable housing and this is where it's really getting very challenging, and uh, I'm just giving that notice for the if there's another motion to come. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the, that heads up, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. I I wasn't going to speak on the initial discussions about uh, items that were being removed. I'm supportive of of all those. Um, since the asset management's been uh, mentioned, and in in regards to, I have a number of questions about asset management that. Uh, Time doesn't allow us. I'm I'm going to follow up with the treasurer in regards to that. Um, at this point in time, I, I do believe that there's a a fairly uh, detailed discussion that we're going to need to have about asset management plan uh, funding going forward. And there's various uh, factors that impact it. I, I recognize, but um, I I wouldn't uh, if 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 that one is going to be put on the table, I would be supportive of it uh, being removed as well. But I, as I said, I have some follow-up questions in regards to stormwater management, which is another uh, high um, high indication from the public that they'd like to see that. They, so uh, I'll be following up on those. Okay, thank you for that. Any other comments on this list? No. Uh, well, I'll just say uh, I do agree with your list, <laughs> and uh, I am in, in in support of it. I am worried about our urban forests because we have had a lot of members of the public uh, tell us about the trees that are dead and need to come down, and they can be safety issues. Um, so I'm glad staff's thinking hard about that and is going to give us uh, their best advice on how we handle that. Um, I like the fact our town has been asked by the UN to run this uh, very interesting conference that we've run for the last couple of years, and I think we have benefited a lot from it. Uh, it does take a lot of time from our senior staff's uh, day to pull that together and, and do such a great job. Um, and I do think this is a good year uh, where we have so many other things on our plate that we give it a pause and use that time if we need to, for example, to get our affordable housing file in order and also to ask... Uh, uh, the partners in this conference to step up this year with their offers of help for the affordable housing uh, priority uh, that they have indicated they would help us with. So, uh, so uh, should we just put all those to a vote uh, all together? Anyone want any any items severed out, Councillor Doherty? Uh, thank you. Um, I guess we actually would be looking at an increase on affordable housing versus what's in the budget if we um, take to heart the request from um, our affordable housing planner and uh, the chair. So I guess we're also <coughs> looking at uh, adding 225000 Okay. I, uh, in fact, I think you know I would definitely support that, and we'll hear from the table. Also, uh, I was hoping someone might want to put on the floor that uh, we allocate our hundred and eighty odd thousand surplus from twenty twenty two to our affordable housing uh, shortfall. 
So let's deal with uh, Councillor Doherty's motion. Uh, would there be a seconder for that? Oh, right, sorry. Okay, so we should hold on the affordable housing motion because we're gonna deal with uh, Councillor Bain's motion first. Okay, all right, thank you for that. Uh, so uh, is everyone content if we vote on those all together? Yes, Councillor Ring. Uh, Your Worship, just quickly, could uh, Councillor Bain just retouch on the ones that he's, because mm -hmm. we kind of jumped around at a yeah, few I, different I did ask here, and I want to know what we're voting for. No, no, I'm just keeping it to the four items. The Heritage Review for $100,000, the Drone Show for 65000 the UNUEF Support for $50,000, and the Software Upgrade... It's not the council one, it's uh, general software upgrades, as I understand it. Uh, yeah, sorry, CEO Skinner, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, prior to the vote on all of those items, I think we did have one, a uh, couple of staff comments, mostly about the uh, AODA compliance and the software, that there may be a component you should be aware of uh, prior to the vote on that item. And I just would briefly mention as well, there was an ask uh, earlier in this meeting, not related to this uh, motion, uh, but uh, around putting $315,000 in uh, fee um, Portable house. free forgiveness for the uh, uh, Georgian Triangle Humane Society as well. So we do have that uh, in our long list, just mm -hmm. so you're aware that's uh, per your earlier vote in the long list. Um, and I'm not entirely clear on the uh, 250,000 spread over the uh, four or five years that they had uh, had uh, had asked for that, but we can make note of it in a future version of the budget as well. Thank you. So, uh, Your Worship, if that being the case in regard to the software, uh, particularly the um, uh, the ODA software response, uh, I can withdraw that item pending staff response to that. I think because I don't want to. Uh, make something that we have to in uh, a previous or uh, subsequent to this then withdraw. So I'll keep it to the three items: heritage. Oh, and drone, then we and, would be uh, looking for an update then, CEO Skinner, with uh, the draft budget number three, or maybe I'm looking at our treasurer for this on the details of that uh, software. Or can you provide us with further information right now? If I may, through you, Your Worship, I think um, Executive Director Peg is on the line and would like to speak to it. There is a, a portion um, that is specific to AODA compliance, um, I, so I think she would like to speak to it. Thank you, Executive Director Peg. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So in terms of the software ask at 32000 uh, within that, there is $12,000 that's earmarked for the social media monitoring. Um, certainly, hearing Council's comments, we would um, be flexible, absolutely, in moving forward without that. The accessibility component, though, the 20000 for that would um, be very important to help ensure that we meet our requirements under the WAG-CAG uh, requirements of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Um, so if we could sever that 32000 uh, that would be very much appreciated to make sure that important work can go forward. Thank you. Thank you. So just to clarify, then, that would be a net 12000 severing the 20000 for the... AODA, is it? Sorry. Right, okay. So right, I've had a thought. Let's deal with each one separately okay. so we're really clear. Okay, so the first one uh, would be the Heritage Review amount of $100,000. Uh, I think we've had good discussion. All those in favor of uh, eliminating that item, and that would be unanimous. Thank you. Uh, the second item is the removal of the amount for the uh, drone show. Um, I think that was 60000 65000 thank you. Uh, all those in favor? And that would be unanimous. Uh, the next item is for the uh, UN conference. Yes, Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you. Um, perhaps I could um, um, formally move and ask for a seconder for uh, removal of uh, fireworks as well. All right. Uh, let's hold that, though. Okay. We'll come back to that. Okay, thank you. Um, so for the UN conference, I think would be the next item. And uh, who's going to remind me what that amount is? It's 50,000. 50, thank 50, you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. 
Uh, all those in favor of removing that item. And that would be unanimous. Uh, and the last item would be the uh, software, uh, the social media, media monitoring portion of the software update of $12,000. Uh, uh, all those in favor of removing that $12,000. And that would be unanimous. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Bain, for that direction. Uh, and then, Councillor Doherty, you had two matters you wanted to bring forward. Uh, yes, um, thank you. Uh, so the first uh, would be um, the uh, removal of uh, traditional fireworks uh, from the budget for 2022-23. Okay. Of uh, 15000 and uh, seconder is Councillor Baines. You all have to share the pain. Uh, I, I would like to hear from staff about how many uh, fireworks displays that we currently have uh, and, and when, that, when those take place. So, Director Culver. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, the town of Collingwood invests in one fireworks display each year on Canada Day. Um, or at least as traditionally. Uh, and um, I will note that we also have a public survey out uh, currently on Engage Collingwood uh, seeking feedback with response to uh, what people feel about fireworks and um, their appetite for alternative displays. I, I, I shouldn't share the uh, results of that at this point because the survey is not completely closed yet. Um, however, um, I, I, I'll just make council aware that that is in process right now and uh, they might be interested in, in the feedback or the result of that. Um, I guess that's what it's really helpful there. information. Uh, thank you for reminding us of that. Councillor Doherty. Thank you. Um, so uh, that being the case, I'll withdraw my motion for the time being. Okay, I'm, I'm sure we'll be revisiting this in the future. Thank you for that. Okay, your second matter. Uh, yes, um, to um, add, re add uh, $225,000 for the Affordable Housing Task Force. Okay, could I have a seconder for that? Councillor Ring. Would there be discussion? Councillor Baines? I just want to be clear about the figure here because, as I recall, the Affordable Housing Task Force, we're recommending three hundred and fifty dollars uh, this year. Um, Councillor Doherty says no, so I, I want to be straight on the amount. I mean, I was in, I could go for three hundred. Um, it's not. I think I think the confusion uh, is that the staff has put one hundred and twenty-five thousand in the budget. Oh, and so you um, want to top it up, topping it up. Mm -hmm. Another right to two twenty-five. I see. to get to the total of three fifty that the Affordable Housing Task Force has asked. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Yes, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin, and I, I'm, I'm going to support this because we're still at the stage of just looking at uh, impacts. Um, I don't think it's a case of where the affordable housing is asked for. It was identified as a, a, an annual amount. Um, I thought what staff had put together when they explained to the reasoning um, for, for dropping the amount uh, in, in 2023 was they felt that there was sufficient funds for the affordable housing to continue to work on the on the work that they want to do, and um, I'll, I'll always believe that if we need a dollar or more um, for affordable housing tasks, we'll we'll be making sure we can come up with it. But I'll support uh, that the larger figure go in for now, and and uh, we're still in the process of trying to finalize. So, okay, thank you. Any other comments on this item? Councillor Ring. Just basically the same thing. I, so I, I, it's this isn't the final budget uh, figure. So I mean, but we got to put that in if we if we if we hope to get to that top dollar, the three fifty. Uh, we got to show it now to see where we might have to do some other juggling of uh, funds in in other areas. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? All those in favor? Uh, oh no, I have. Yes, I think Councillor Baines has seconded that. Yeah. So what we're voting for is adding. 
Okay, what we're voting for is adding uh, $225,000 into the budget to top up the affordable housing reserve fund. Right? Okay, all in favor? And that passes unanimously. Uh, so our CAO has reminded us of the ask of our uh, Humane Society this evening. Um, which was for forgiveness of what may be $315,000 of their development fees of, of various natures. And also, uh, although f I guess the 250000 would be starting in 2024, as I understood. Um, okay, Councillor Doherty. Thank you. Um, I w would like to... Uh, how do we treat this uh, in the in the budget? I guess it's as a loss of revenue. I get, I guess, um, out of the planning as opposed to a line item in the budget, as opposed to an expense. That's my first question. Mm -hmm. My second question is, um, I guess, I'd like to know, you know. If all of that would have to be accounted for this year, you know, like it sounded like that was um, the sum total of all of their um, planning, uh, anticipated planning fees and charges. So I'm going to assume that not all of those would be um, applicable for 2023. And the other thing um, that I'd like to put forth is. Um, they um, noted that they have seven other municipalities um, who they are approaching uh, for um, cash donations from 2024 uh, up to, I think it was four years, so 20, 2024 to 2028. But I'm wondering if those same municipalities could also be support, uh, approached to help offset the town of Collingwood's loss of revenues um, associated with this request. All to say, um, I'm wondering if we could just maybe hold that item until we have answers to those questions. Yeah, or so even a question, I guess one thing that we could actually put back to the GTHS. Uh, perhaps what you're asking for is a staff update uh, for when budget number three comes back to us because I think also to put into the mix uh, is you know how much have we been giving to the Humane Society over the last number of years I think we do not charge them rent uh, for their current land and they also have a tax property tax uh, uh, relief there. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things that we need to hear from our staff about okay. where all of this is at. Uh, would, would you like to make that motion perhaps? Um, certainly. Um, so um, I would move that uh, we request a staff update uh, to um, provide us with a summary of all of the benefits that GTHS receives from the town at this time, um, what the uh, uh, some total of the develop. Well, I guess we have a, a pretty good indication of what those um, planning fees would be, um, but how many of them, or how much of them, mm -hmm. uh, would actually be um, uh, charged in 2023? Uh, and also, I guess to go back to um, GTHS and um, ask them um, if they can approach the other municipalities um, and uh, uh, ask for offsets to the town's loss of revenue on planning fees. Okay, could I have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Perry, thank you. Uh, would anyone have any questions or comments? Councillor Baines. It would seem to me that in the next 10 years, uh, there's going to be a lot of growth and similar requests this will, in my opinion, establish a precedent that if a MRF, well, excuse me, when a MRF comes, um, a living arts center, uh, goodness gracious, a hospital, etc., that we should be careful in how we deal with this one because it could establish the precedent for all the others coming after. So I'd, I don't know whether 
too late to put that into the hopper as far as a discussion goes, but I think we should be cognizant of this. Having said that, I'm fully in support of the Humane Society and their efforts in this, but um, they just have to be cautious, I think. That's, that's a good, good note for us to be keeping in mind. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on this? Okay, I'll bring this to a vote. All those in favor of this motion? And that would be unanimous. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to bring anything to the table about the budget discussion today? Councillor Doherty. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and um, as we um, uh, ask uh, staff to um, complete their analyses and, and bring forward a third draft of our budget, I'm wondering if an analysis uh, could be provided um, as to the growth that the municipality has experienced uh, since the last um, uh, census data. So I guess it's five years, six years, is that right? Um, number one, and how that compares to the um, growth in terms of our staff complement uh, over the same period of time. Uh, and uh, also, a, um, I guess, a, a statistic um, relative to um, staff per capita or something so that we can um, do a apples to apples comparison year to year. The um, reason why I'm asking for this uh, is, um, uh, you know, every year um, there are um, s staff additions requested uh, and a great deal of conversation um, and discussion goes into that final decision. Um, but I do recall uh, former treasurer uh, Leonard uh, bringing forward an excellent analysis um, during the last, the, the previous uh, term of council to show the difference between the growth rate of the municipality at large and the growth rate of our staffing complement. And there was quite a disparity uh, in showing that um, we were uh, certainly not keeping pace with the growth of the municipality in our addition of um, um, a staff complement year by year. And that has an effect, as we all know, on level of service. Okay, could I have a seconder for that? Councillor Ring? Uh, You're asking for a staff update. Yes, a staff the, update on the, um, a comparison of the growth of the municipality uh, since the last census period or, or earlier. I'll, I'll leave that up to staff. And growth of our staffing complement, total staffing complement, year by year. Councillor Ring? Oh, I guess I'm not. I, I don't. I don't have an issue. Uh, just wait. I think I sh you'll second it. Okay, that's what I was hoping you'd do. Okay. Anyone like to comment on this? Go ahead. <laughs> now, now that I second it, probably not. <laughs> no, I just. Uh, I just. At, at the why I was so hesitant to to second it was I. Seconding to get it on the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, would anyone have any questions of, of staff or the mover uh, or any comments? No, I'll bring that to a vote then. All in favor? And that would be unanimous. Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Ring. We're done uh, budget deliberations for today. Um, I just, I got a request and I guess I should make it a motion um, through you that uh, we have a tentative third draft uh, S SIC meeting scheduled September 14th, which I, is, is, I think is impressive with, uh, with the discussion we've had today, and, and, and we've sent a lot back to, to staff for review. I'm just wondering if it would be appropriate for a couple reasons to put it off maybe a, a, a And uh, a couple of the reasons are is I was really impressed with uh, and, and, and pleased to see the amount of uh, public uh, input we got at our at our public sessions and, and 
opportunity to take a look at the discussion here today and see if you'd like to add. And and uh, and I understand that we could put a, 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 a what they call a budget book on our town website for public input for uh, any further questions, recommendations, and and or. So I would like to make a motion that we put the uh, uh, tentatively scheduled December fourteenth. Uh, up till uh, um. okay thank you for that so I, I hear two parts to this motion uh, one is to bring the third draft of the budget uh, back to council in January uh, to allow for further uh, public input uh, and uh, the second item is to have the third draft of, of the budget, which then could become a budget book, <laughs> uh, put on our website uh, before Christmas. Yes. If I could just yeah. add to it, I, 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 I know the I know there's the rationale for trying to get a budget passed as early in January. Um, but I think with uh, this, this year's going to be a a, a little. Just a lot of work that's got to be done, and we got to make sure it's done right. Um, the only reason I'm saying that is uh, um, probably easier for for staff, possible for tendering. Uh, that that. But I think that try to uh, speak into the mic. Yeah. We're going to try to uh, uh, get this originally all. <laughs> <laughs> approved in January. I, I think putting it off a couple more weeks isn't going to. Okay, thank you. Could I have a seconder for that motion? Yes, Councillor Potts, thank you. Uh, would there be any uh, discussion or questions on this? Councillor Baines? I defer to the Deputy Mayor. Oh, Deputy Mayor, there you go. Well, th thank you, uh, Councillor Baines. Uh, I was just going to repeat uh, from from the last meeting. I had said I'm fully prepared to accept any um, anything that the uh, department heads bring to the CAO that they feel is something that has to get tendered quickly um, to to entertain those um, because I think there could be those um, that we're not aware of. So we don't want anything to slip through that way. I did have that discussion with our CAO, and she has indicated she would bring something forward uh, if it needed to be dealt with uh, urgently. So thank you for raising that again. Uh, so it's Councillor Baines. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm thinking about this. I, the, the challenge in this, and I would, if your motion was to be to go through, I think you'd put an amendment for one more public meeting. Oh, no. Just no? The next public meeting. The next pu public meeting, which would be... You're suggesting in January? I, th I think if I can uh, explain, if it goes to, say, a strategic initiatives committee meeting okay. in January, there is a public portion just like there is today. So if the public uh, had a chance to review uh, our next draft of budget, say, if it's on the um, website before Christmas, there'd be several weeks for everyone to have a look and weigh in again. If I, I think that's uh, what the intent was. And that would be draft three? Yes, I just can, I should just uh, clarify with our treasurer, if I may, on that. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. You're correct. It, that would be budget draft number three. That'll be the toughest one, right? Yes. So, uh, yeah, if if I, I could support that, if it's going to be hopefully in early January, and that's basically it, um, and then make a decision. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. If I, may add to that, I apologize for uh, kind of as 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 mayor indicated I had kind of two motions in one there but no that it was just to put off the 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 uh, proposed third draft for for a couple of weeks and instead of mid December putting it in early January hey thank you were there any other comments or questions on this and we have a second do we have a second yeah, okay. So we'll bring this to a vote then. All those in favor? And that's passed unanimously. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to look to staff here. Is there anything else we should deal with on the budget before we move to the next item? Going, going. <laughs> CAO, go ahead. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think that's everything that I had at top of mind. Thank you. Uh, okay, worship. good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to go back now uh, to 7.2. This is the item 
T2022-15 fees and service charges. Um, so there's two parts to this. Firstly, that staff report T2022-15 be received. Uh, and that uh, the second part, that council enacts and passes a bylaw to establish the 2023 fees and service charges. Um, and I know that uh, we recall that Deputy Mayor has declared uh, a conflict as to one or more line items uh, relating to this. Uh, Clerk Almas, have you managed to identify uh, where in particular that is uh, in the staff report? It is, I believe, on page 15 under corporate management and administration under taxi licensing, which is a, a fee of our business licensing bylaw. And what page of the agenda would that be? Okay, page 19 of the agenda. So could we deal with this, uh, just keeping that particular, uh, so is it, let me find page 19. I have page 19 as the budget. Page 19 of 214, is that right? Okay, I have Mayor Hamlin, I found it. Okay, thank you. So it's under general government uh, on page uh, two of the fees and charge, charges uh, summaries. Um, it has the uh, section about uh, taxi tariff rates and that. Do you, do you see it? I do see it, yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's part of uh, that... Morgan. Looks like it's page one and it goes into page two because it deals with the uh, limousine uh, and taxi cab. So this whole section I'll say on licenses for taxis. Uh, we'll deal with that at the end. How's that? And we'll deal with the rest of uh, the uh, report. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, turn this over to our treasurer uh, to lead us through your report. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, we do have a short presentation coming up. Uh, thank you. So, and, and maybe just to, to make it a little bit easier, um, the, the taxi licensing is not um, changing this year. So, um, there won't be any um, change reflected in the in the actual bylaw. I don't know if that helps things at all. I'll, I'll, I'll let the clerk decide on that. But um, it, it, it is the rates are remaining exactly the same. So whatever is in the bylaw today would be consistent with what would be presented for 2023 as well. Okay. And uh, next slide, please. So um, just to give a little bit of background. Um, Section 390 to 400 uh, governs the authority of the uh, municipality to impose fees and service charges. And it's important as a municipality to ensure that um, user fees uh, allow for the recovery of costs associated with the delivery of services and programs for the ongoing maintenance of facilities, equipment, and other infrastructure that we operate. Um, as in past years, the town will experience cost increases in 2023 for many reasons, including higher wages, inflationary increases, increased costs for utilities and generally just higher costs for equipment purchases and maintenance. And as part of the operating budget process and similar to the procedures followed in prior years, um, DHs have met or to review their respective fee schedules 
and have provided some recommended changes to recover the costs associated with providing these services. Where services are similar across department staff are recommending that those fees be brought to a consistent level across the organizations. And um, departments have again been very cognizant of the current economic conditions and have held increases to the minimum possible. Next slide, please. So uh, there are a, new, a few new charges that have been included for 2023 um, with respect to the bylaw. The first one um, is being introduced by FIRE and it's an inspection compliance fee. And this is a charge uh, set at $115. And it's for failure to comply with the findings of any initial fire inspection within 30 days. There is also a municipal consent utility application fee that um, the engineering department is bringing forward at $100. And it's to review and grant authorization to a utility company to occupy, um, install, or move utility infrastructure within the town's right of ways. We have um, parks, recreation, and culture requesting to bring forward an aqua therapy program fee at $80 um, and the seasonal boat launch and combined seasonal boat launch and parking fees for non-residents at $100 without parking and $200 with parking. Next slide, please. We have a few more. Um, uh, most notably, uh, these are coming in from planning. And just as a reminder, we are going to do a full free uh, fee review of all uh, development services um, throughout uh, the early part of 2023. So the first one that's being requested to be added is a, a minister's zoning order request. Um, and MZO effectively replaces the need for an official plan and zoning bylaw uh, amendment. And it's a uh, provincial approval process with municipal endorsement. We also have uh, a request to include um, community infra infrastructure and housing accelerator uh, requests. And uh, the CHIA order effectively replaces, again, the need for the OP and a zoning bylaw amendment. Um, so we're asking for some fees associated to help cover the cost from uh, the employee standpoint. Um, a block plan, uh, which is a non-statutory process to, to comprehensively plan for major development proposals, uh, including road layout, lots and blocks, location of parks and trails, um, to name a few. We're also requesting bringing forward a fee for the uh, a phasing plan, which again is another uh, non-statutory process to uh, address the orderly and logical efficient staging of major development proposals. Um, we're also requesting a secondary plan OPA. Um, secondary plans are statutory processes that address the orderly and comprehensive development, usually to coordinate multiple properties or a large geographic area. We have a block plan amendment fee being included. Block plans are for major developments, which evolve over time and may require updates or changes to respond to site-specific circumstances. And finally, there is a phasing plan amendment as well. Uh, phasing plans for uh, major development will evolve over time and require updates or changes to respond to site-specific circumstances. So essentially, um, the planning department has proposed these um, six or seven new rates. They are listed under section, I believe it's E, um, of the uh, fees and service charges. And it's to recover um, fees associated with uh, not only staff time, but legal, um, uh, professional consultants and things of that nature. And of course, to continue with um, growth, paying for growth. We also have um, the building department requesting a fence variance application fee. And then our environmental services or water and wastewater requesting a fee for the quench buggy, um, as well as an after hours uh, labor fee. Next slide, please. We have a few other um, significant changes. We have um, an increase in marriage licenses. Um, the town of Collingwood has been historically sig significantly lower than surrounding and peer municipalities. So we are requesting a, a, an increase in that uh, a fee. We also are asking that the resident busker fees be reduced to zero um, and non-resident uh, busker fees to remain at, uh, or to be reduced to $20. Um, there's several factors that came into to looking at this, including a scan of what neighboring municipalities are doing and discussions with current and past brokers who felt the fee was a barrier to participate. Um, a license will still be required at no cost to the performer for a resident. However, a non-resident will, will pay the uh, reduced fee of 
Um, under the Public Works Department, we have a vector truck uh, disposal fee increased. It's significantly to adjust the external cost of dumping. Um, and then we have uh, PRC, um, the museum. There was um, several services that are no longer being offered. So those have been removed. Um, and then there is a decrease to the digital image um, usage fees. Um, and finally, my apologies, uh, the uh, EBA increased to the Sports uh, Hall of Fame rental deposit as well. And that, I believe, is the last slide. Uh, charge a staff report, please press the raise your hand feature. Okay. So um, I'd ask council to we'll put this on the table now. Um, so I think what we'll do is, uh, so let me just stop and turn to uh, the deputy mayor about his conflict. Uh, the fact there's no changes to the fee structure, does this change your conflict? Uh, do you know or? Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Um, my, uh, when I uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, even though it's a continuation, um, I do need to step aside. Okay, thank you for that. So uh, what perhaps what we'll put on the floor then is number one, that the staff report T2022-15 be received. Could I have a mover and a seconder? Councillor Baines, Councillor Potts, thank you. All those in favor? That's unanimous. And then the second uh, motion we'll put on the floor that council enacts and passes a bylaw to establish the 2023 fees and service charges, except relating uh, to the fees affecting taxi service. Okay. Um, so could I have a mover and a seconder for that? Deputy Mayor Fryer, Councillor Ring, thank you. So could I have uh, comments or questions from council? Councillor Baines. This is, uh, I suppose, a question not about the fees currently, but a, a potential for an option. Uh, last June, the Optimist Club, of calling out uh, which time I was the president, did its annual um, fish derby and got a lot of kickback from our attendees, particularly in regard to the tickets that many of them received because they obviously hadn't kept up with the news that residents of Collingwood should register their licenses, in which case they wouldn't be dinged. Uh, but don't confuse the issue with logic. Many hadn't, and our attendance, A, was down, but that's not to do with the parking issue. But it got us to thinking that could we not come to the town and ask for a, an omnibus packet of permits, if you will, I don't know, say 20 or so from 8 to 12 o'clock, we would purchase them on behalf of our attendees and whether we charge them or not to recover our costs wouldn't matter, but they'd put them in the windows and the bylaw officer would see that they're okay and then we figure out how we get the payment back. But it's just, um, it didn't, <laughs> it, we were unhappy because our attendees were unhappy and uh, you can't really argue with them to say, well, you should have registered your car and wouldn't have been a problem. It's just a thought that in the future that whoever is, does that come under uh, a director Culver or whoever sets these rates that might discuss this concept of an omnibus permit for an organization? Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Um, would there be a staff member who, yes, director Culver, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, through you, the actually council assigned this uh, responsibility to to staff uh, in the previous council, and we uh, we've come together with a a plan for pretty much exactly what Councillor Baines is describing. I, I don't know what the maximum number is. I'd have to check with my staff, but I think uh, a package of tickets or passes uh, for uh, people who apply through the special event permit process um, will be allocated. Thank you. Can I ask, I'm going to ask a follow-up on your behalf. <laughs> uh, has this, uh, I haven't seen a report yet, have I, on, on, on this uh, suggestion? Can no, no, sorry, through you, Mayor. Yeah. There, there, it, was, uh, it was recommended by Council, so we put it into our special event permitting process, but uh, I can bring an update to Council um, 
soon and then and and then make sure that everybody's aware of the new the new process. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yes, Clerk Almas. Certainly. Thank you. Um, Dean is maybe not as familiar because he just had inputs, but there was a report that went to council last July regarding this. And uh, it was called Sorry. Complementary Parking for Charitable Groups. And it was a result of a, a few charitable organizations uh, having events down there. So there is a program in place. Uh, and it was a pilot uh, parking program to look at relief uh, for charitable and nonprofit organizations during fundraising events. Um at waterfront and paid parking areas. And uh, I'd have to take a look at the details further, but we can circulate that to council on, on what's currently happening. Great. Yeah, because I do remember this report, but the uh, uh, the idea of a uh, package of passes, if you could include that, that would be really helpful. Okay, thank you. Yes, Deputy, Fryer, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hammond. Um, I have two areas that I wanted to ask about, and the first one I'll ask about kind of ties in a little bit with what we just talked about. Um, in the D2 part under Port of Collingwood, um, this new uh, season boat launch pass and parking pass for non-residents, it's uh, going to be set at $200. Um, we heard at the open house uh, from one of the, um, one of the attendees a, a concern about uh, the, the charging of non-residents, most specifically, I think, direct non-residents like Town of Blue Mountain uh, uh, residents or, or Wasago residents. So I wondered if this type of charge is typical, um, it, it, like like if, I, I'm, I'm not even sure if Town of Blue Mountains has boat launching facilities. Um, so it was just, uh, it's a new charge. It's the $200. Um, the other charge is the season boat launch pass for non-residents, which is 100. And if I compare that to what we charge residents, it's 85. So it didn't seem to be too much of a difference there for me. But the 200 one, I wasn't sure about. And as I said, I was relating it back to the concern about um, about charging uh, neighboring residents to come in and, and, and use our facilities and if there's reciprocal things that are usually done and that type of thing. So okay. I, I guess I don't, I guess it'd be a question through to, to, uh, to Director Culver, um, if, if I could, please. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Director Culver. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. So if I'm understanding the question correctly, the, it is whether, um, whether there are reciprocal agreements or, uh, strategies when it comes to our neighboring municipalities and uh, truthfully there there are not <laughs> we don't have uh, we don't get relief from say Wasega Beach or or um, town of Blue Mountains regarding either boat launch or parking um, there is uh, the the adjustment that you're seeing actually is us um, opening up the scope so initially we did have a package uh, opportunity for people within our neighboring, uh, regional municipalities, um, and the challenge there was that. Uh, so there were two two parts. One was if you lived outside of those um, opportunities, you didn't have access to our services. Um, so that created a problem, and we came back to council last term uh, to try and include Singhampton, where there seemed to be a bit of a concentration of, of people interested in using our facilities. Um, and council council passed that. So the ch change you're seeing is to basically open it up beyond those boundaries to say anybody from outside of Collingwood would have access to that that fee structure. Um, and then uh, the second thing uh, was to do with um, annual passes. We only offered annual passes to uh, local residents um, this year and didn't offer that opportunity for um, people from outside of Collingwood. And now we're offering the opportunity for um, seasonal access like to, to buy one one pass for the season uh, so that's the other change that's being indicated in the fees and services so hopefully I, th I think I've covered off the questions but if I haven't please let me know uh, th you through you uh, mm -hmm. chair um, thank you that's very good uh, so it's not necessarily a new charge it's a new charging method replacing the previous so that that's uh, very helpful so the other area I was going to ask about was the um, regards to the uh, planning and development and, and a number of new fees uh, being introduced there. And what I was going to ask about is um, it does say that there's a fee review underway. So my understanding then would be these are kind of the best estimates at this point in time. 
that we're going to put in place until that fee review is is completed and um, and then there may be changes as required. Is that a question? Uh, yes, and I guess through you to the CAO. Or perhaps I think maybe uh, I'm seeing a little interest in answering this <laughs> from Director uh, Valentine. So go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Through you to the Deputy Mayor, your assessment is, is essentially correct. We do have a fees and services uh, review for the entire development process, and that would include planning, building, engineering, and any other fees identified, uh, which is in, in the procurement process at the moment. Uh, but we're not expecting the full results of that review for, let's say, four to four to six months. But we did identify some relatively uh, large gaps in terms of our planning fees. So we undertook a jurisdictional review uh, looking at what other municipalities are charging for those fees and we put in uh, the very low end of uh, what we were able to find in order to ensure that uh, the fees review could adjust those as appropriate. So we did uh, do some initial research and what you see here again is uh, on the lower end of what we found. Just a, a very, a just a very short follow-up. Mm -hmm. um, as the treasurer identified, um, I just want to make sure the public understood. Um, we need to set fees in December for 2023. Um, that's a requirement, and <coughs> and so I wanted to make sure the public understood that uh, even though there's a review underway, these are our best guess estimates at this point in time, and and they're required to be in place um, as we move forward in 2023. So thank you. Okay, thank you for that. And the, yes, Councillor Baines. Uh, just to give my colleagues some perspective, the cost for docking my 22-foot boat in the township of Georgian Bay, albeit at a private marina, is $1,850 per season. Here it is, as I make out, $1,320, which is a deal, in my opinion, and very reasonable. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any other uh, comments or questions on this? Yes, Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you. Um, just uh, generally, um, I'm ob obviously very pleased to see that these are matching inflation. Um, you know, there's we're being um, um, challenged to you know try to keep our expenses down. So if we can offset with revenues that are actually covering our costs of operation on a percentage basis anyway, then that's a, a good thing. Uh, and I was um, um, very happy to see that there is a comprehensive um, taxi fee review underway because I do think that... We're going to talk about taxi next. Okay, sorry. Okay, I'll, okay. Save, I'll save that. I'll save that. Okay. So um, I only have uh, just one small comment. Uh, it's with regard to um, swim programming. The um, bronze, bronze Cross and National Lifeguard Service uh, fees uh, for those courses. Um, I know that uh, we are challenged to find uh, lifeguards. Uh, in this community, as are a lot of communities. Uh, so it just seems to me that if we could hold those fees, then that would um, 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 provide one less deterrent uh, for anyone who is interested in getting qualified. Mm -hmm. So I would, um, as an alternative, I would like to suggest that for those three programs that the fees be held um, the same price as, or the same cost as 2022. And uh, I'll just write those down. What, what were those programs again? Um, National Lifeguard Service, uh, Bronze Cross, and uh, Bronze Medallion, and Emergency First Aid. It's, I guess that's a combined course. And the last one was first aid, did you call it? Bronze medallion, emergency first aid. Right, okay, that's right. Okay, so that's a motion you're putting on the floor mm -hmm. to not increase the fees for those three items. Yes. Okay, could I have a seconder for that? Councillor uh, Perry, thank you. Uh, any discussion on this? 
Well, I have to say I agree. This is uh, we're having such a hard time uh, filling our spots, and the pool's not open all the time, and uh, it's not been a great situation for our residents not having the pool open. So, uh, okay, bringing this to a vote. All those in favor? And that passes unanimously. Thank you. I have to say uh, also, you know, it, it breaks my heart to see a lot of these charges go up because uh, a lot of it's for recreation facilities. So I'll just uh, remind uh, council and the members of our community that uh, there is a program uh, for a reduction in recreational fees. And I'm going to ask uh, our CAO just to remind us of what exactly that program is. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll turn that right over to oh. Director Culver since he's there to talk about our uh, our uh, wonderful affordable recreation policy. For that, Director Culver. Uh, thanks, Mayor Hamlin. Thanks, CAO. Uh, so the uh, the access to affordable recreation policy um, allows us to utilize a fund that was generated by the I'm going to get the year wrong, but I think it was the 2012 uh, Ontario Winter Games, and it uh, that basically. Um, a reserve that we're able to tap into to um, support applicants who um, who uh, show need. And so there's a process, which I won't try to explain because quite honestly, it's uh, something that staff manages. Um, but if you're interested in, if anybody is interested in uh, getting support uh, for access to town programs and even third party provided programs, uh, they should just reach out to us at PRC and we'll get them into the process. And uh, there's, there's an assessment, but it uh, um, it's actually quite simplified, I believe. And, um, and yeah, it's a way of providing uh, a relief to individuals who may otherwise not be able to afford. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you for explaining that. Um, okay, so uh, if there's no other comments or questions on uh, this motion. Okay, all those in favor? Do we already vote on this? No, okay, thank you. <laughs> That's a lot of voting going on here. <laughs> okay, unanimous, thank you. Uh, any other comments on uh, this matter? On the fees and services? Yeah, I, I'll come to that. So, but uh, just to finish off on uh, the voting for, we voted on your motion specifically, and now we have to vote on the first part of the fees and services. Okay. Oh, together. Okay. All right. We need a trained up mayor sitting here. <laughs> It'll happen. Okay. Deputy Mayor, thank you. So uh, the deputy mayor is now uh, leaving the uh, room at, uh, do I need to tell the time here? 5.53. Okay. So we're now going to focus on the changes, which uh, there are none. Uh, so this would be a motion to confirm the um, fees and service charges relating to taxis for the 2023 year. Could I have a mover and a seconder for that? Councillor Doherty, Councillor Baines, thank you. Any comments or uh, questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that's passed unanimously. Uh, Deputy Mayor, you can uh, return to Council Chambers. And that's at 5.54. Thank you. No, 5.56. I can't even tell time. All right. The next item, I, we have just a few items left. So, and I know we're going to, I'm going to be suggesting a 25 uh, minute break. So we'll just push on if uh, anyone, uh, if everyone's with that for now. Okay. So the next uh, report would be item 7.3. This is T2022-16, 2023 development charges. The Council receives staff report T2022-16 entitled 2023 development charges for information uh, and endorsement. So Monica, I'm, uh, Monica, I've got my notes here. It says Monica. I'm going to say director, our treasurer, could you please give us your report on this? For sure. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I don't have um, a presentation on this. It's short but sweet. Um, but this is with respect to um, our current development charge bylaw, which references an indexing that occurs each year um, to bring in the non-residential building construction price index on our development charge fee schedule. So this year, as we've talked about several times through the budget process, 
The NRB CPI has increased by 15.6%, and um, that is uh, reflective as of the third quarter. So what we're um, including for the um, rate update results in um, the urban rate for a single family home. The development charges will increase by $5,521. Um, for other multiples, it will increase by $4,162. Um, for apartments, the rate increases um, for a two plus bedroom up by $3,315. And for uh, a, a bachelor apartment or a one or less um, bedrooms, it increases by $1,921. Um, with respect to the non residential um, increase, uh, the change year over year is $20.63 per square meter. So Again, the increase to the development charges happens annually. It's based on the NRB CPI for the third quarter increase um, of that particular year, and in this case in 2022, which equates to 15.6%. Um, there are a lot of unknowns when it comes to um, creating development charge studies on when the timing of things can be de delivered. Um, and of course, given the very recent passing of Bill 23, um, it will reduce the number of properties the town will actually be able to collect development charges on and potentially have other impacts that we're yet to um, fully understand and, and put to um, paper for uh, members of council. We feel that these charges, the increase for these charges is, um, is appropriate. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Clerk Thomas, would there be anyone uh, online in the gallery who would like to speak to this item? Thank you, Your Worship. Again, those uh, participating remotely, if you would like to press the raise your hand feature, if you'd like to address the staff report regarding development charges. There's no interest at this time, Your Worship. Okay, would any members, uh, could I have a mover and a seconder for uh, this, please? Director, uh, Deputy Mayor Fryer and Councillor Doherty, thank you. Uh, would anyone have any questions or comments? Yes, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, it's, it's, it's a substantial increase. And um, in, I, I took a quick look at our neighboring communities, and, and the DCs are, are in the same range. Um, so I, I think that uh, obviously there's nothing wrong in that regard. But um, one thing I noticed was there was a reference in one of the communities to uh, a lower amount for a prepaid situation. And it got me thinking about the, um, the fact that we're in December. Um, if we approve this, the, uh, I, it, takes, it takes effect in January. Um, is there an opportunity for developers when there's a substantial increase like this to do some sort of prepaid situation? Uh, that's a question through you to the treasurer, I guess. I'm just looking at, um, as I said, if we're gonna make this kind of substantial change, um, is there an opportunity for developers to come in and, and prepay at the lower rate? And if, if that th does happen, when would that happen and when would it uh, cease to be available? Okay, thank you. Uh, treasurer, could you please answer that? Thank you, Your Worship, through you to the Deputy Mayor. Um, so development charge rates are frozen at the point um, of a site plan application or zoning by law amendment. So um, if those applications were in process and, and they were approved, then the rates that uh, stand at that point in time is what would be collected at um, from the developer. So essentially, um, not it's not really prepayment. There isn't that, that, that I, I'm not familiar with using that term so much, but rather that the rates are frozen at the point of those applications being approved. Any follow-up? Uh, no, that's no. fine. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Uh, any other? Uh, yes, Councillor Baines. Uh, through you, your worship to uh, CAO Skinner, it, it uh, strikes me, uh, certainly during the campaign, I heard a number of developers just blast us for the costs that they had to pay the town, et cetera, et cetera. It's outrageous, et cetera, et cetera. I made no comment. But it, it it's almost disappointing, I think, that some of them didn't take advantage of this opportunity to come on and share with us their thoughts. And I'm just wondering, were they all copied on... Uh, sort of diving into this specifically that they you know we're inviting your opportunity to come in and tell us what you think um, whether they do it or not but it, it just strikes me that 
maybe they didn't know uh, about this opportunity specifically on this item, or have there been other opportunities where they might have commented? Sorry, CEO Skinner, go ahead. Um, thank you, Your Worship. The um, uh, this uh, process of uh, changing in accordance with inflation is just the normal approach that's set out under the bylaw. Uh, so we did not send an, uh, a note to the development community, particularly inviting them to comment today, although the material was published on the, uh, on the public agenda. I think there is um, an ongoing need for dialogue with the development community. And I know that uh, Director Valentine and others have had some uh, conversations with the uh, uh, the Georgian Triangle Development Institute, not on this item, um, in the uh, the weeks past. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Also, uh, I have a question, sort of, as uh, an law director or treasurer, are we doing a development charge uh, review study this year with a view to setting a new bylaw? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I first I'd just like to add on to uh, CEO Skinner's comments as well, if 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 you don't mind, um, to Councillor Baines. I would also share that um, you know we have looked at what other municipalities are doing. Um, the neighboring municipalities are following the same sort of CP or NRB CPI uh, increase that we are, as well as the county. Um, although the county, because of Bill Twenty Three, their development charges will decrease significantly. Um, because they will have to pull out the social um, housing portion of their DCs, but still will follow the 15.6%. I would also share that the fact is, is that the cost of construction is increasing rapidly as well for us. So if we want to continue to do these um, projects that are included in the study, we need to make sure that we're collecting the fees that are associated with those projects. So for all of those reasons, that's really why we we do the indexing each year. Um, um, and I just I just wanted to to add on to that just to share those those pieces of information. But yes, you are correct, uh, Your Worship. We will begin the process of a new development charge study throughout um, 2023. Um, we our current DC bylaw expires in September of 2024. However, we feel that there's so many changes um, that are happening that um, we'll, we have a lot to um, to accommodate. So we expect to start that in the third or fourth quarter of 2023. Okay. Thank you. Did you have any follow-up, Councillor Baines? No, thank you. No, okay. Uh, any other questions on this item? Okay, yes, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, was, I had the same uh, concerns as, as Councillor Baines, um, but I, the way I looked at this, because there was substantial change last year as well, the, the Treasury referred to in an earlier report, another 11 uh, and over, it made 27% over the course of the two years. But um, it, this is a known thing we can do according to policy. Um, there's other things that are going to come down in 2023 that we are not sure what the impacts are going to be. And so I, I'm supporting it because it's an appropriate step. It's, it's, it's following policy and we'll be dealing with some of the other impacts of 2023. A certainty is that the cost of the projects are going to be higher. That, that, that's a, a given with this. So, so I'm a supportive of it and, uh, and taking it forward. Okay, thank you. I think what we'll find is our development community are facing the same uh, construction cost increase challenges uh, that we are, <laughs> and they may not be surprised, they may not like it, and nobody likes an increase like this. It's shocking when you think of uh, this kind of increase, and we've been dealing with it, of course, with our own capital projects here in the town. Um, okay. All right, so uh, if I could bring this to a vote then. Uh, all those in favor of the uh, receiving this for information and endorsement. And uh, that's unanimous. Thank you. So I believe we've gone through all the staff reports. Uh, the next item is a notice of motion at 9.2. This is my notice of motion. I'll read it in and then we'll deal with it at a future council meeting. 
Uh, whereas council deems it expedient to have regular discussions with the business community, be it resolved that council here and request a staff report be prepared regarding the potential establishment in terms of reference for an economic development task force or other similar recommended body that would support the ongoing communication with the business community and allow for the exchange of ideas and recommendations for town-wide economic development direction and goals, and that staff report back by not later than March 2023. Okay, the next item on the agenda uh, is item 10.2. It's the, the uh, 2023 draft meeting calendar. Uh, there's no action that's required. However, I am going to put a motion on the floor, uh, f and I know that uh, Clerk Amos will help me uh, come with the wording for this uh, to appear on the agenda. Um, and I'll just say what the intent is. Uh, my intent is to uh, have included um, as meeting dates that we avoid for our standing committees and for council, uh, any that would fall within the major school holidays. And that would be our Christmas break holidays and also our March break. Um, and I'll just say the reason for this is uh, I know many of us, including me, are committed to getting a younger generation step forward uh, for our council positions. And uh, I would like us to be in a position where we can say to future people who are interested, yes, we understand that there are several weeks in the year that uh, you know, it's impossible likely for you to attend because you may have younger children in the school system. And I'm so mindful, and I'm, not, I'm trying not to speak to this, but you can hear my passion. I'm so mindful of when I was working in the private sector, there were no meetings of significance held during the major school holidays. So uh, anyway, I'll bring this forward as a motion um, at the next meeting, and I expect it will be along the lines of... Um, But we don't need to have this considered until March 2023, right? So the motion could address that as well. Yeah, go ahead. Certainly. Yeah, thank you, uh, Your Worship. I think what we can do is, regardless, it's it's noted today as a notice of motion. And when we bring the report back pertaining to uh, the request on the governance model, we can include that component in it if it gets passed on December 19th. That would be great. Thank you. Yes, Deputy Mayor, did you want to comment? If you're complete with yours, I, I'm yes. fully supportive of it, but it um, kind of, uh, I had a question about the calendar as a result of our decisions today, um, most specifically on um, on the one Monday, it'll be SIC and Corp Services uh, separate meetings. Is there ability to have one meeting so that staff has, or, or procedurally does it need to follow the two? Yes, uh, Clerk Almas, go ahead. Certainly, uh, procedurally, we should be keeping it se uh, separate if it's it's kind of a training for, for council, as a discussion was tonight on how those committees are set up. Then we'd have to get into um, amending the terms of reference for those standing committees to, as well. So maybe simpler to keep them separate. Okay, thank you. Any other questions about the draft meeting calendar? Uh, seeing none, uh, the next item is public delegations. Uh, would there be any tonight, uh, Clerk Almas? Thank you, Your Worship, for the members attending remotely. This time is uh, set aside for members of the public wishing to address the Standing Committee regarding any mandate within the Strategic Initiative Standing Committee. If you would like to address count or the committee, please press the raise your hand feature. And there's no interest from the public to speak to uh, the, the committee at this time. Okay, thank you. So the last item on this agenda is our in-camera. And I'm going to ask our clerk for some guidance on this. I would like to uh, have uh, a break now. So shall we move in-camera and then adjourn once we get in-camera? Does that make more sense? Or how do you suggest we handle this?
Certainly. I'll, I'll uh, just advise uh, yourself and, and uh, members of the committee that the in-camera is approximately 20 minutes uh, for the overview uh, and the update that's needed. Mm -hmm. And we do have consultants that were waiting um, at this time. So I'm not okay. sure if you'd prefer to conclude the meeting and research, uh, recess before we get into the special counsel and the, the uh, corporate community services. Okay, so I guess the request would be that uh, we move in camera, maybe have a five minute break uh, and uh, do our in camera and then we'll have, have a break at that point after in camera. Okay, so I'm going to read this in, see if there's a, a will of counsel to move in camera. Okay, whereas the clerk hereby concurs the reasons for the in camera session have been duly reviewed and considered and the matters are authorized under the exception provisions to conduct a closed session in accordance with the Municipal Act prior to proceeding into closed session. Therefore, be it resolved that this council proceeds in camera in order to address a matter pertaining to, one, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposal of land for town or local board purposes, and that's A, and two, a position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried, on, carried by or on behalf of the municipality or local board, also A. Items for discussion, A, Collingwood Green Terminals update. So could I have a mover and a seconder for that? Deputy Mayor and uh, Councillor Doherty, thank you. All in, so all in favor, and that would be unanimous. Thank you. And there will be a rise in report, so we would be coming back to council table in any event uh, for the other items, but we will uh, continue this meeting after the in-camera. Thank you.
Mm-hmm. Or you could put both of them there, and if you turn either way, you got one. I was going to blame the mic say it wasn't working. Okay, we're live now? Yep. Uh, so I'm looking for a mover and a seconder to uh, rise uh, from the in-camera session and report to council. Deputy Mayor Fryer, Councillor Jeffrey, uh, Councillor Jeffrey, Councillor Doherty, thank you. Um, I just want to comment uh, before I read in the, well, I guess I should read it in first. Hold on that one. Hold on that first. Okay. All those in favor? We have risen and re we're about to report. Uh, and the motion would be uh, that council hear and receive the in-camera report regarding the green terminals revitalization and authorize an extension for the completion and presentation of the draft MOU for council's consideration not later than February 2023. Uh, so could I have a mover and a seconder for that? Councillor Baines, Councillor Ring, thank you. Uh, and I'll just briefly uh, comment uh, that uh, there has been an active uh, negotiation ongoing between the proponents of the project and our negotiating team. Uh, they are not yet in a position to bring the draft MOU uh, forward in a finalized form, so hence the uh, request for extension. Uh, once the MOU is in a form for Council's approval, we will be able to move to uh, public uh, release of what the concept is uh, for the terminal project and the and the spit. Um, and I hope that I know our community is very much looking forward to moving swiftly to the public engagement process, uh, as we all are. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll just ask uh, for all those in favor of the motion I've just read in, and that would be unanimous. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned early on, I wanted to just give a very brief update on uh, the Sunset Manor uh, situation, as I'll call it. Um, as uh, the community is aware, there's currently 50 beds that are unoccupied at Sunset Manor, which is a county-run and owned uh, long-term care home in our community. And for 19 months now, there has been a hold on new admissions uh, to this long-term care home that's been imposed by the minister and ministry of long-term care. And it has to do with compliance issues at the home. This has, was made so important, I know, to me and to all of you during the election campaign. Uh, that we have just uh, concluded. And it is urgent that, that we move to find care close to home in this facility because there are so many loved ones in our community who need this. So the county's working uh, with an experienced management company, uh, which is a requirement of the ministry to reopen the home. And uh, we have had some initial uh, meetings at the end of last week with senior staff at the county and also the warden of Simcoe County. Uh, and I intend to reach out to the Minister of Long-Term Care tomorrow uh, to urge him to do whatever is within his powers to support our residents in need as quickly as possible. So I just really wanted to assure, uh, assure council and our community that I understand the urgency of this matter. And early in my term of mayor, I've made it a priority to express the needs of Collingwood residents to both the county and the minister uh, to open these beds as soon as possible. So with that, uh, I'll look for uh, an adjournment of this meeting. Could I have a mover? And that would be Councillor Potts. Thank you. We don't need a seconder. For that. Oh, okay. All those in favor? And that would be unanimous. Thank you so much. Now we're going to move to a special council meeting.